call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Mid Coast Community Council uh, for May 11th, 2016. Uh, we'll start the meeting with uh, council member self-introduction, starting on my left. Dan Haggerty. Lisa Ketchum. Claire Teton. Dave Olson. I'm Chris Johnson. We have two members who will not be here tonight, Aaron Deinzer and Laura Stein. Okay, uh, first up, we have the Board of Supervisors report. Ellie Donovan. Thank you, Chris. Um, good evening, Mid Coast Community Council and community members. Um, my name is Ellie Dahlman, and I'm here on behalf of Supervisor Horsley to provide a few updates for you. Um, first off, uh, some of you may have heard last week a 28 foot sailboat beached near the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. And as the sailboat began to break up, it was clear something needed to be done to clean up the debris uh, before it uh, made, damaged the coastline or the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. And so luckily, a lot of people came out to help over the Mother's Day weekend. Um, Parks Director Marlene Finley kept a close eye on the boat and had a lot of assistance from uh, many different agencies and volunteers, including the Half Moon Bay Yacht Club, Pillar Point Harbor Master, County Sheriff's Department, California Fish and Wildlife, uh, neighbors of Seal Cove Beach, friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, um, and many other individuals, um, some of which I'll name, uh, Dave Olson from the Mid Coast Community Council, Keith, Keith Mangold, Mary Lorenas, um, Harbor Commissioner Sabrina ben Brennan, and uh, park rangers from the San Mateo County uh, Parks Department. Um, thanks to everyone's help and collaboration, the boat was successfully removed. So um, it's a great um, accomplishment. Um, secondly, I'd like to provide a brief update on the Peninsula Clean Energy Program that um, some of you may have heard about. I know the um, Office of Sustainability has come and provided a couple presentations, but for those of you who are not familiar with the program, um, it's an alternative electricity provider to PG&E focused on supplying cleaner electricity to San Mateo County customers. Um, so the at least 50% of the electricity um, will come from renewable sources such as solar, wind, or geothermal. Um, it will be an opt-out program, um, meaning customers will automatically be enrolled um, and you'll be notified in the mail, you'll get inf more information, but um, if anybody's interested in learning more about the program, uh, you can visit the website www.peninsulacleanenergy.com. Um, and at the, this last board meeting on Tuesday, um, the Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to loan PCE, or Peninsula Clean Energy, funding for startup costs um, and a loan for um, bank financing, both of which would, will be paid back um, by the PCE once it begins receiving revenue. Um, but that, that's a brief update. There's a lot more to learn about that topic. I know it's a very new um, area for some people, so I encourage you to visit the website or contact the Office of Sustainability with the county if you have any questions um, about that. And then finally, um, on Monday, um, Supervisor Horsley facilitated a meeting with the Planning Department, Public Works, and uh, some residents from Date and Cedar Street here in Montera. Um, they discussed the process uh, for bringing roads up to county standards um, and um, talked about how Supervisor Horsley and his office um, could help residents um, go through this process. So just wanted to let you all know. Um, that that meeting happened, and um, that's all I have this more th this evening. Um, unless there's any questions from the council. Does anybody on the council have a question for Ellie? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what does it specifically mean to bring up roads to county standards? I mean, what what that you know? Yeah, so um, Joe Lococo um, in Public Works Department would be able to provide the specific details, um, but from uh, my understanding is that um, I think there's a specific width um, that the tra that uh, is required on either side, um, and uh, there also if you're going to be um, turning a what is a pervious um, surface into an impervious surface. Um, uh, by paving what was a gravel road. Um, uh, there's certain requirements for um, bioswales um, and kind of water drainage, I believe. Um, but um, Joe Lococo is the expert, so um, I'd be happy to um, get some more, uh, like a, maybe a handout I think he had um, that would give you the exact details um, of what that would mean. The road standards are posted on the 
MCC website on the roads page. It's there. The road well, standards. Would I be the first one to object to um, affecting the rural feel of our community <laughs> in regards to this? Um, probably not. Um, okay. I think I think that um, the 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 meeting was requested by the residents who are interested in making some improvements to their um, street because I think there's some issues with dust and some potential drainage is issues, and so um, public works. Um, was able to explain, you know, if you want to uh, bring your street into the county road system, um, this is what you are required to do in terms of improvements. Um, but there is the option of um, making, the, the residents can make improvements to their street, but they don't necessarily have to bring it up to county standards. Um, if they make improvements that are, uh, that do not bring it up to county standards, um, they would, the county would not maintain the road. Um, would, does not and would continue not to maintain the road. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, just to point out also that the road standards in the mid coast were revised just because of uh, the MCC did this in the early 90s and the road standards were changed to accommodate our rural, uh, what the residents wanted in this area. They didn't want the general standards. So if you look at the cross section, you're going to see very minimal. Although El Bernada has different standards than Moss Beach and Montana. Has two options, so we can use the Moss Beach and Montero standards where desired. We had the Seal Cove roads improved, you know, about two years ago or three. Don worked to get that funded going, and we specifically asked not to have the county standards because that would have made them wider than all the other roads in the area. And they went along with that, and they incorporated them into the county road system. Yeah, Dan, uh, that's a good point. There's one road in particular there that seems quite narrow when you compare it with other roads. So I say go check out that road in Seal Cove. You'll know which one I'm talking about. It's a long, straight road. It's it's, it's quite narrow. So they haven't, you know, uh, big wide shoulders and big wide legs. But you have to specifically ask or negotiate with them. Get something which it sounds like this group of people in the community are doing right now. Uh, Bill? I want to go back to the clean energy. Uh -huh. One more, more on the on the um, sorry, um, the funding. How would that work? Uh, yeah. So for those specific streets, um, uh, because it sounds like uh, the desire um, is not to bring them up to county standards, that's not something that um, the county would be able to fund. Um, but Don is looking at, or Supervisor Horsley is looking at ways to assist through kind of maybe the permitting process and just in um, general understanding what the process is or would be to make any sort of improvement to the road. Okay. No, please keep us posted. Yes, yeah. I will. One second. Bill, you want to follow up on it? I want to follow up on it. You, you mentioned that um, the Board of Supervisors voted to give a loan to the Peninsula of Clean Energy. Uh -huh. Do you know the amount of the loan and is there an interest or is this interest free? Um, I'm not, let's see, I, let's see here. Um, so it, the, for the startup costs, they, um, they're they loaning uh, about $1.88 million um, uh, for startup costs and initial operating costs. And then um, in addition, the board also authorized um, to enter in negotiations to loan a deposit of six million to be used for collateral for bank financing, um, which will be used to purchase electricity for the Peninsula Clean Energy customers. And as I mentioned, both um, amounts will be repaid to the county um, by the PCE um, uh, when they uh, once they begin receiving revenue, which is projected to be December 2016. And the repayment terms and rates are still being negotiated, so that may answer the question. Uh -huh. uh, so one more thing on Peninsula Clean Energy. Their board meeting is tomorrow night. Uh, so go look at their web page if you're interested in attending. They are also having a series of community meetings. I believe there's four. They're all over on the other side of the hill, scattered over the next couple of weeks. Um, they had also announced they were taking names on people who are uh, being interested in being early um, adopters of PCE. The original plan is, was to go primarily with uh, businesses, but uh, 
they for people who are interested in being part of um, getting it going, uh, you can contact uh, PCE for more information. It's all on the web page. Yeah, and I think um, just to add on to that, the first, it sounds like the first phase of customers will be enrolled um, this October, um, but any um, everyone will be notified um, 90 days before the enrollment time period begins. Um, so. PCE? Yeah. Bad attitude somewhere there. <laughs> so we do have coast, two Coast Side advisory members on their advisory board. Um, Catherine Slater Carter is one. I've forgotten the other one at the moment. Um, Harvey, yeah. Uh, probably is Harvey, yeah. So they would be the appropriate people to ask. I will, uh, that's Catherine and Harvey. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Leonard. Does anybody else have any questions for Ellie? Great. Thank you very much. Ellie. Yeah, Appreciate thank that. you. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, now we move on to uh, the public comment period and announcements. Um, if anybody has a comment on an item that's not on the regular agenda and would like to make a, a comment, please fill out a speaker slip and bring it up here, and then you can make your comment. Also, uh, if it, anybody on the council has an announcement, um, now is the time to do that. Please remember that uh, the council may not discuss or take action on any items that are not on the agenda. Dan, did you have? Yes, uh, I'd like to announce that in Half Moon Bay, there's going to be a, a safety bike rodeo on Saturday, May 14th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Cunha Middle School at 600 Church Street. Uh, the bicycle safety rodeo will be held at the middle school in Half Moon Bay. Deputies will, be, will provide personal education on bike safety and will be assisting children as they ride their bicycles through riding patterns. And they're asking to bring your family, friends, and bicycles, of course. So that's Saturday, May 14th at Cunha Middle School, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Thank you, Dan. I know that's a topic near and dear to your heart. Yeah, it's important that kids learn at an earliest age possible to ride their bicycles safely because they're going to grow up and be riding them all over our community and elsewhere. So <laughs> be crazy maniacs like me? Is that what you're trying to say, Dan? Well, no, I'm not saying that at all. Okay. Um, I, have, safe. <laughs> I have an announcement I'd like to make to the community. I got, uh, some of you may have seen this, it was uh, publicly posted, but um, just wanted to uh, make this announcement. This is from Felix Al Young, the Director of Business Development at Midpen Housing Corporation. And he writes, <clears throat> Midpen Housing appreciates the active community engagement around the 11 acre site in Moss Beach. At our community open house in March, we received lots of valuable input. We are currently evaluating this feedback and will share a summary of the input with the community shortly. We are also concurrently starting design concepts for the property that reflect this community input and look forward to sharing our ideas with the community at a second open house slated for late June, early July. We appreciate your patience as we work to develop a sensitive and thoughtful proposal for the site that is compatible with the existing neighborhood and conserves a significant portion of the site as permanent open space. Um, I have... Could I just make one quick announcement? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this, we announced this last time, but oh, whatever. The co there's a coast side sea rise and erosion form coming up on... Um, May 24th at the Douglas Beach House, 311 Murata Road in Miramar. It uh, doors open at 6. The program starts at 6.30. There'll be, uh, the Army Corps will be there to present their long-awaited study and reports, and there will be uh, others. There's a flyer posted on the MCC website. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. So now is the time for a topic not on the agenda. I only have one speaker slip. If you want to make a comment on item on the agenda, now's the time. And I will start with Leonard and then Bill. A um, bunch of different things. Real quick on the mid pen thing. Um, if, if they're proposing leaving uh, a big part of the site as open space, and, and then you know they're talking about high density for the rest of it, if you end up with the same number of housing units, if it was if it was sold to you know some private developer that built uh, you know the, the the monster houses that we've seen for the last decade and a half, then there's going to be no open space left. So you know this is one of those be careful what you ask for things. And and if they abandon that site, they're going to look for someplace else on the mid coast because the only thing that matters to most 
elected officials, um, and I'm not one of them, uh, but in San Mateo County anyway, most elected officials only care about one thing, which is maximizing the number of housing units. And in San Mateo County, about the only place to put them is to, to hammer them in here. So, you know, if it's not that site, it's going to be somewhere else on the mid coast. Um, I have uh, comments that are kind of related to two of the things on consent, but, but not exactly on point, so I'm going to make them here. Um, on the um, uh, Jabuta Pampas Grass letter, um, I support the letter as is, but um, it, it occurred to me after seeing the draft of that that um, pub general public education also needs to be done. The, the letter is addressed to various agency managers, and they're probably the bulk of the problem, but there are people planting that stuff in their gardens because they think it looks nice, and so the, there needs to be a, a very broad uh, public education program about why that thing is such a disaster. Um, and regarding the letter to Caltrans about ocean views and vegetation management, you know, as usual, it's all about uh, Moss Beach and Montero and ignores El Granada. And El, El Granada is a much more complicated problem because the crooked city of Half Moon Bay and the crooked harbor district. Um, but the, there's, a, there's a property owner who loves to plant walls of cypress, and I won't name him because uh, by the time I get home, there will be a message on my answering machine threatening to sue because that's the way he works. But the wall of cypress that was planted a number of years ago along the west side of Highway 1 north of Capistrano needs to come down. And I'm hoping that that's actually on Caltrans property. And so maybe the letter that you have on consent, somebody could ask Caltrans to check and see exactly where the boundary is. And if those, in fact, are on Caltrans property, and they might be, then Caltrans should just, um, without further ceremony, just rip them all out, cut them down to the ground. Because the intent there is specifically to block the view so that when the next monster inappropriate building is proposed there, people won't be able to say, well, it's going to cut off my view, because he'll say, well, there's no view because of the trees. That's the intent there. So, uh, you know, both of these consent items, I think, need to be expanded and, and look at a bigger picture there. Um, so I, I would appreciate Can I uh, just ask you a clarifying question? Um, the trees can, in El Granada, is can I suggest that we just take this off consent if we're going to discuss it? Uh, I couldn't hear the question. Well, we're going to pull it off consent, don't worry. All right. Talk about it. Okay, so then I'll, I'll speak to it at that time. Um, and I. Oh, I thought I had one other comment, but I've lost track of what it was. So, uh, and I'll also uh, wave my hand now so that you know that I'm in line for the uh, roundabout agenda. You, you'll need to wave again, but I, I hear you. Yeah. Now, and I should point out at this point, because it's not obvious to everybody, anybody who wants to talk about anything on consent can ask the chair to remove it from consent. Right, but the, the, the agenda item warning has this wasn't clear. I hope I remember. I just wanted to make a simple little announcement, uh, and I fortunately forgot to bring it with me. Um, Memorial Day weekend, I think that's uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the 28th, 29th, and 30th, uh, Coastside Emergency Action Program and Coastside Emergency Corps are actually doing a simulation of a shelter in place, and they have some volunteers to help people. I kind of told them that here in Morris Beach, we do that every weekend because we can't <laughs> go anywhere. But um, for those of you that actually can travel, um, and if, if you're not going away for the weekend, the only thing I remember, and she's going to kill me for this, is if you contact Sharice at the chamber, <laughs> which is easy to find, she can fill you in on the details. Also, Michelle Dragony, but I don't have her web slash email with me. Um, that would be another one. Uh, if uh, people at home get this and they know my email, if you send it to me, I'll forward the email to them. And if you want, Lisa, I could forward that to you if you want to. Sure. Okay. I'll thank you. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Bill. Chris, Bill's comment reminded me of what the other thing was that I was going to mention. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think the date is uh, 6 11, as in June 11th. Uh, the county has their annual uh, um, emergency preparedness thing over at the uh, county uh, event center. What, Anybody county know for center? sure? 
what? Yeah, yeah. 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 They, uh, uh, yeah, near 92 in yeah. Delaware yeah. or something like that. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that's uh, June 11th. And, and I think if you get there early enough, uh, it's free parking. Uh, I haven't seen the flyers yet. They usually have a red and black color flyer. If you could fill out a speaker slip, and the next person is Marsha Yates. Marsha Yates, resist density in my speech. Reading between the lines best as I can, I guess Midpen bought the 11 acres and no, are drawing they have the plans. Not. They have and not. They have not? Okay, and well, they'll be building, they plan on being building something sometime. The project managers have come out from under their hiding place and gleefully announced they're going to have another community meeting. How can our input be valuable if it's based on their generic information they're giving us and not rooted in any specifics to the project since none have been revealed? They emphasize how much they value our input and prove it by moving forward the, with this project even though we don't want it. Following in the footsteps of Connect the Coast uh, people, having townhouse meetings to get our input is a ploy to make us feel like they are really interested. But in reality, they don't give a rat's patooties how we feel and how we would like it. Proof? We don't like any of it, and they're both still moving forward with their projects. I'm opposed to the Midpen project. It's incompatible with the federal guidelines and same for sustainable, affordable housing in its location, nearness to jobs, schools, food centers, public, public transportation, and road safety. It doesn't follow the San Mateo guidelines to creating healthy cities and affordable housing. Another issue that we haven't addressed, but we kind of did today, was uh, if this project goes ahead, who is going to rebuild the roads after they've destroyed all those little skinny roads um, but with all the heavy duty uh, construction traffic? Does, is um, Midpen going to fix it? Or is my tax dollars going to be used to repair the roads they destroyed? And one more comment. You know, Supervisor Hordley hasn't uh, had the courtesy to be at any of the meetings or respond to any emails. Please convey to him our continuing disappointment in his disinterest in representing his Coast Eye constituents. Thank you, and remember, resistdensitymb.org. Thank you, Marcia. Did you want to speak oh. to an item not on the regular portion of the agenda? Well, it was, it's on the consent agenda, so it's not going to... Which item is it on the consent agenda? Um, the Caltrans Okay, we, um, uh, that's probably going to get pulled, so why don't you just wait and see if we see if it gets pulled. If not, we'll find a way. Let's just pull. I think okay. We've had a couple comments, so I am going to make the decision. We're going to pull the letter to Caltrans Roadside Vegetation Manager requesting preservation of ocean views <coughs> from consent. It will go at the end of the regular agenda. Um, so you will have an opportunity to speak at that point. Okay. Okay. Um, does anybody else have a public comment they, they would, on something not on the agenda right now? Okay. Okay, great. I'm going to close public comment. We now move to the consent agenda. We've pulled item B has been pulled from the consent agenda. Is there anybody else on the council or the public that would like to discuss another any other item on the consent agenda? Okay. So, um, do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Second. Okay. Uh, the motion is to approve the three remaining items on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Five zero. Okay. Great. Okay. We now move on to the regular agenda. First up tonight, we have Kellex Nelson from the San Mateo County Resource Conservation District. It's going to be a very good presentation to tell us all about it. Thank you. Do we have a, Do we have a clicker? We do not have a clicker. Just say next and I'll get it. Okay. Here's our clicker right here. Okay, Dave, it's a clicker. Sure. Sure. Thanks. I'll need the back. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
So thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you, you for coming. having me. Um, I actually I haven't been to Mid Coast Community Council in a, oh gosh, a few years now. Um, I feel like I'm always at PMAC, so it's nice to be here um, and be able to tell you a little bit about the Resource Conservation District, or RCD, as people commonly call us. And uh, my name is Kellex Nelson. I'm the executive director. If you haven't met me and have seen my name in print, it's not a typo. It's actually Kellex. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about the RCD as soon as it comes up on the screen. Actually, as long as we're waiting for that, I can also point out that our board president, TJ Glothier, is here. So, thanks, TJ. I'm sorry, I TJ Glothier is our board president. He's also here. It's just one of those. Huh? It, it was on. Actually, Dave, do you want to? Do you want to trade places, and then I'll? Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine. OK. OK, slideshow. OK, so um, um, resource conservation districts, or RCDs, um, there's almost 100 of them in California. The one in San Mateo County is the one that is yours. We're your local special district. And I'll go into a little bit of detail about what the RCD is in San Mateo County. So we were actually the first RCD in the state of California, formed in 1939. Um, we've had an office in Half Moon Bay that entire time. That was the old office in the upper left corner. Those are roughly our district boundaries. There's actually a number of excluded areas, donut holes in our district, which we serve anyway. We're unable to do that in, in the, our authorizing legislation. We were formed in partnership with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. We were formed by farmers originally to serve agriculture, and then our mandate broadened for a much bigger picture for addressing natural resources. So what we do, we provide people with technical assistance. We, do, we implement projects. We help with conservation planning. We do a lot of education and outreach. If you click again. The thing that's key about it is that we do literally everything through partnership. So the RCD is, is different from, in terms of the way we accomplish our environmental objectives, we're not maybe a land trust or a state or national park that owns land. We're not an advocacy group. We help people help the land. That is our job. And we do everything through partnership. Another defining feature of how RCDs work is that our work is non-regulatory, confidential, and free. So we help public and private landowners best na manage their natural resources by providing them this confidential technical assistance. Our program areas all boil down to projects or assistance in these four areas. We address water resources, climate, wildlife, and agriculture. So I'm going to kind of just skim through some of these projects and what we do in the different program areas. In terms of water, um, pe people in the mid-coast are pretty familiar with the fact, I think, that there are some water quality issues and concerns at beaches or in creeks. We do a great deal of water quality monitoring. The, um, the, the photo on the bottom shows the, um, the sign that you frequently see at Fitzgerald Marine Reserve where San Vicente Creek comes out. And we have a number of water quality monitoring programs, including some that have volunteers, including the First Flush um, program that's in the upper left. Leonard is one of our stalwart volunteers for First Flush. And, um, and we have some staff involved in that as well. So in addition to monitoring, monitoring water quality tells us where there are problems and the extent, how significant the problems are. They may, that monitoring may or may not tell us the source of the problems, but the important next step is to address problems. One of the ways that we do that is um, on individual properties, helping people implement best practices in their yards or um, what have you to slow water down, sink it, spread it, help the soil do its natural filtration. And this was actually a project that we did, actually a program with a number of homeowners in the mid-coast to protect water quality entering the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve through a series of demonstration projects. We also um, send out alerts um, letting people know there are a number of people who are like me who love dogs and love the environment and don't wish to choose between them. And so um, they may also be like me in that they don't always think about their backyard being a contributing source of bacteria to local water bodies. 
So we send out alerts to people who are on our distribution list to let them know targeted times to clean up pet waste in their yards before storm events. Many of you have seen the permanent posted sign at, um, at Capistrano Beach in Pillar Point Harbor um, closing the beach because of bacterial problems. Nonetheless, you'll see even here at low tide people collecting clams to eat, filter feeders, in an area that's permanently posted. So um, some of you are familiar with the project that we undertook a few years back to identify the sources of fecal contamination, bacteria into the harbor. Actually, what you see here is um, the, the pink and the green was actually part of um, us dyeing the harbor to conduct a circulation study to understand how bacteria might be transported in the water. And then we also genetically tested the bacteria and did a number of other things to identify what some of those sources may be. This is an example of a larger scale project, whereas the everybody, you know, individual backyards are examples of the smaller scale technical assistance for individual homeowners. And then here's a, something that's more of a group type, type of engagement. So. Um, this is working with a horse boarding facility um, on Sunshine Valley Road that, uh, to help them install um, a commercial scale manure composting facility. And we used it as an opportunity, kind of like a barn raising, to bring people out, a lot of people from the horse community, to work together to help this landowner um, implement this best management practice while they all learned the skills to be able to take it back and do it in their own, on their own properties. Also in our water resources program, so a lot of that was focusing on water quality, but in the drought and with limited water resources, a great deal of our efforts have to do with um, water conservation, water use efficiency, and that sort of thing. We provide significant technical assistance to the farms in the area on water conservation and irrigation efficiency. And um, before it was Rocket Farms, back when it was Nurserymen's Exchange, um, we worked with them to harvest the rainwater from all of the, that roof space and also to recycle the water after they irrigated their crops inside, for which they won the Silicon Valley Water Conservation Awards and ceased to be the top customer for Costa County Water District. They were actually paying municipal rates for their water, and this um, enabled them to become more uh, competitive, more cost effective, and have significant conservation benefit. So that was a little bit about our water program. Um, in terms of climate, our climate program really has two pieces to it. One is mitigating climate change, meaning literally trying to re reduce the, um, uh, the, the contribution to the atmosphere of greenhouse gases and also take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, as well as adapting to climate change. So um, next slide. So we work with a number of folks on um, uh, implementing alternative energy for pumping and other uses, including wind and solar. And, um, and we actually are part of some significant innovative efforts to sequester carbon, take carbon out of the atmosphere through innovative agricultural techniques. There's extraordinary opportunity in rangelands and also in row crops to contribute to solutions to, uh, to climate change through rotational holistic management practices and grazing. And um, many of you know Cabrillo Farms. It's across from the Half Moon Bay Airport. Um, and that farmer allowed us to do a demonstration project utilizing biochar. It's an, actually an ancient technology that's recently back in vogue as a potential solution or part of the solution to climate change that we tested on his Brussels sprouts crop. So in terms of, the, the, so those are some of the examples of mitigation. And then in terms of um, adaptation, one of the things that we see with climate change is um, uh, an abundance or a lack of water. You know, there's flooding, there's drought, which is it? All we know is that it's a lot of extremes. So in Pescadero, um, where the main, or in some cases only road into town is flooded um, in small rain um, events, we worked on finding sustainable long-term solutions to flooding that are integrated with habitat enhancement and restoration of the marsh. Also part of the equation is looking at fire, um, the increased risk of fire, particularly with drought. We, um, we partnered with CAL FIRE and the uh, RCD of Santa Cruz County to develop the Community Wildfire Protection Plan for this region, which among the benefits was it, 
I gave a certain federal designation to some of this area as a wildland urban interface, which makes it eligible for federal funds to address some of the wildfire risk. And then also, we've undertaken some demonstration projects to show people what they can do to manage fire risk in their, um, in their neighborhoods. So here at the end of Coral Reef Avenue, this is, you see the dense eucalyptus, which is a huge fire hazard adjacent to densely populated area. And so, um, go to the next slide, Dave. So we showed people what you can do with minimal or no permits to reduce the, the fire risk. Because so much, some of the things um, that are longer term solutions um, involve um, really extensive permitting and cost. So moving on to our wildlife program. Um, San Mateo County is home to an extraordinary abundance and density and diversity of protected, threatened, and endangered species, protected both under federal and state law. So um, we're, we're rich in having that available to us, that um, we're really lucky to have them around. We're also very constrained by having um, all these species around. And so we work um, in to restore um, these populations, recover populations of some of these species. Um, on the upper left, so you've got um, steelhead. Um, we also work a lot for coho salmon restoration, California red-legged frog, marbled merlet, snowy plovers, San Francisco garter snake, the list goes on. Um, but also, interestingly, many of our efforts to restore habitat for one species is hampered by protective measures for another species. So we're navigating a very complex regulatory framework. Some of the projects that we do to restore species actually have mutual benefit. We're always looking for the win-win for agriculture and for species. An example is pond restoration. When we can restore a pond as habitat for something like red-legged frog and San Francisco garter snake and waterfowl, while ensuring water supply reliability for farms in a drought, we consider that a big win. One of my favorite things is that we are dam blasters. We remove dams, a lot of them. And so we have been removing, we're on a roll with removing almost all of the human-made barriers to fish passage for salmon um, in, uh, on the coast. This is a project we completed last summer at um, Memorial Park in Pescadero. By removing that dam, so that was the dam, if some of you may remember, that used to form the, um, the swim hole, the, the swim pond. And when steelhead were listed for protection under the Federal Endangered Species Act, the county was required to open the flashboards. There used to be, this was a flashboard dam, meaning that th those are the wing walls to the dam, and they could put boards across it to fill it up with water, the creek filled with water during certain seasons. When steelhead were listed for protection, the county was required to remove those boards and leave it open at all time. But the, but the concrete structure that remained was still a barrier to fish. We removed that barrier, that's the bottom picture that's taken from the same perspective. In fact, you can still see the wing walls to the side in concrete. And that restored access to 62.5 miles of some of the best, most pristine habitat for coho salmon in that watershed for spawning and migration. It's really an incredible project. Okay. This is one that's closer to home. This is on Frenchman's Creek. To give you a sense of scale, I could stand in that culvert, that, well, which is probably not saying much, I'm only 5'2", but it was still a big culvert. And um, so what happened, and this is something that you'll regularly see, is people will put a culvert in, in a creek because they need to get from one side to the other and they needed water to go through somewhere. And that, when you, when you put water through a pipe, it goes faster. And when it goes faster, um, it churns up the creek bed and then it drops and over time it carves away the creek bed to the point where this was, had dropped probably about 15 feet. And so um, steelhead could no longer get upstream, they can't make that jump. So um, the farmer needed to get from one side of the creek to the other, the farm field. And this is an example of a project where I think the RCD can bring a lot of value because we can work across boundaries, across jurisdictions. So. One side of the creek was the city of Half Moon Bay, their local coastal plan, their building codes. The other side was the county's local coastal plan, building codes. One side of the creek was owned by BFI, the, you know, the landfill. One side of the creek was owned by a private landowner. And then there's an agricultural tenant on both sides. A lot of interests in this. But the fish, they don't care who owns that. They just need to get up the creek. 
So we worked with all of these stakeholders. The farmer was so accommodating that he was willing to actually have his workers carry the harvest across the creek that we had dewatered during construction so that we could get this project done. The next slide shows once we removed it. So we recontoured the creek to a more sinuous, um, w the way a creek is supposed to look. And then to make up that grade change, we put in a series of step pools. So now from being a straight shot with a big drop, we made it um, more sinuous with a series of pools and then put a bridge across here, a rail car bridge, and revegetated the area. And then today, this is what it looks like. It's all grown back in, a couple of pools, you see steel going up, nobody would ever know how intentional those features are. So just as a quick before and after. And that's actually um, about eight pools to, to make that elevation change and the sinuosity of the creek. So that's some of the work that we do for habitat restoration for wildlife. And then agriculture um, is, is really our roots. So we were formed by visionary farmers in the 30s in response to the Dust Bowl crisis. When the federal government recognized that topsoil was actually a national resource and they created the Soil Conservation Service, local conservation districts were established around the nation to make that federal agency accountable and locally relevant. And that is why our boards of directors are comprised of local landowners to provide direction to that federal agency. And so we still work extensively with agriculture and we work where we're invited in this non-regulatory fashion to um, help them be the best stewards of land that they can be. A lot of our work comes down to balancing demands there are, I mean, to state the obvious, in San Mateo County, coastal San Mateo County, we don't have snowpack. And um, except for Coastside County Water District, the rest of the coast doesn't have interties with, you know, state water projects or Hetch Hetchy or anything like that. So we're looking at something like Pillar Cedos Creek or San Gregorio Creek. You know, you're looking at creeks that at low flow I can jump across. And there are people that depend on them, recreational needs, domestic needs, there's threatened and endangered sa salmon species, and agriculture, which is part of our economy and the rural integrity of the area, all depending on very limited resources. So a lot of what we do um, is bringing people together to um, come to um, common understandings of, actually, Gail, that's you. Do you remember that? See, that's your back, the League for Coastside Protection. <laughs> That's when we were doing the Pillar Cedos Watershed Plan a while back, yeah. Um, so a lot of what we do is um, convene these disparate interests, find common ground, find projects that everybody can agree to and look for that win-win. And a lot of our work also comes down to education and outreach so that people just have the best available information, have the technical assistance they need. Um, upper left, we're working with a group of volunteers for Post Peninsula Open Space Trust, upper right, um, college students, we bring college students out regularly. Um, the bottom photo is from our, um, we have a program regularly that's the blue circle that brings together people to discuss sometimes difficult issues in a social setting. Um, and then also, next slide, um, we also try to reach audiences that are, are typically underserved by those kinds of workshops. So for example, we did pretty extensive outreach um, in Spanish to farm workers about watersheds and water quality, and that's the upper left. Um, on the right, you see where we brought some folks together, some farmers and ranchers and environmentalists and others to talk about use of Roundup and um, provide some information in current science about round, Roundup and exchange. And then that bottom photo was um, getting um, equipment operators from local contractors out to talk about best management practices about erosion and roads to reach the people who are actually boots on the ground. I think an important point to make about the RCD is that we receive um, a whopping $57,000 a year as property tax base. That's our operating base, which we leverage to bring in $42 <laughs> of state and federal funds for every property tax dollar that we receive. It's very difficult to do our work. Our business model is very challenging, but I think that we're a pretty good bang for the buck for people in San Mateo County in terms of what we bring in and what we accomplish. And, um, and that's it. I want to encourage you to visit our, our website is up there, our Facebook page. We also have a YouTube channel with a number of videos. Um, 
and adding some more. We're going to be putting up more when we're out in the field and we see salmon spawning or something cool happening. We're going to be putting more of those videos up on our, on our pages. We're also going to be having some of our staff out in the field explaining restoration, explaining projects, explaining geology, that sort of thing, and have those available for people to learn a little bit from our incredible team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galax. <clears throat> what a great organization. Um, Lisa. Uh, I love the pictures of the dam removal, the streams there. Do you anticipate that there will be increased sediment for beaches as a result of that as well? You know, um, no. I, I don't think the, that's not a significant enough sediment source. There are sediment benefits because removing the dams um, helps gravel sort properly. It restores the appropriate dynamics for gravels for fish to spawn and that sort of thing. Actually, ironically, the Pescadero Butino watershed is listed as impaired under the Clean Water Act and subject to new regulations that are being developed because of excessive sedimentation. Um, but that sediment is filling up the marsh and the lagoon. It's not addressing the beaches. So we have these pockets of um, um, sediment starvation, beaches that need nourishment, but we also have water bodies that are impaired by too much sediment and they're not, um, not connecting. It's a question I often ask too. How can we, you know, connect these efforts? Well, there was mentioned that one of the reasons we have less sand is because of all the dams. That, so it's just I don't think so much on the coast. Yeah, I think that's true for, you know, like Hoover Dam. Some, some of these really bigger dams play a big role in terms of sediment, how sediment's transported in these systems, a little less so with the kinds of dams we have. So anybody else that has a question, Dan? Yes, uh, thank you, Kellex. And I uh, was kind of uh, interested in, in the uh, uh, project at the local farm here with the biochar. Is there any preliminary um, information you can share with us? And are we recommending uh, uh, biochar use for, for local uh, backyard gardeners, vegetable gardening and stuff? So um, the, the benefits of biochar in terms of carbon sequestration are pretty well documented. Our goal was more to um, pilot and understand how to operationalize that for conventional uh, row crops at a certain scale. And that included doing cost benefit and, and crop yield estimates. So basically, I mean, for a lot of, for a lot of people saying, Al Gore talked about this in Copenhagen, isn't, isn't a sell, you know? Um, that's, they're not, that's not the bottom line. So we wanted to know, would this affect the bottom line? Would this help with crop yield? Would this reduce um, costs? And we also really wanted to look at um, the potential for biochar to improve water quality because the, um, the benefits for um, climate are rel relatively well documented. There's less that was well documented about what it can do for reducing inputs onto crops and um, how it might uh, run off of a field and how it might go down into groundwater. I would say that our results, uh, ours was a, 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 field, um, a field study, a demonstration study. It wasn't like a peer-reviewed research paper, so it's not gonna have those kinds of conclusive results. And also, our farmers tend to be so efficient with um, water use on the coast that we don't have runoff from fields, so it was hard to measure. The final report is on our web page. Um, would I recommend biochar for backyards? Maybe, but probably compost as much. Compost for, for backyards would probably accomplish a lot of the same benefits. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Claire? Just a really quick question. I think you have an office in Half Moon Bay. Yeah. Where is that? Um, you know where Goldworks is? Yeah. So the back side of the Goldworks building is us. There's okay. a little parking lot behind. There's the parking garage and there's a parking lot behind it and lo across from La Piazza. So we're on Miramontes. Okay. And there Prisma. were things sent out that I vaguely remember seeing about like volunteers for for First Flush yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And I had no idea where you were, so now uh, I know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, TJ. I can just add, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, Kelly has been doing a terrific job. So many of you may have seen her in the projects over the last several years. But she has really built up the, the uh, 
uh, the role of the RCD in a very effective way as a partner. And I think that I think she emphasized on the first slides are really important. It's a partnership, it's cooperative, it's confidential, not a regulatory agency or whatever. And it's taken some time to kind of build the trust of the farmers and ranchers and other landowners, but I think that has, has come about in more of a sense that there's a real value to be gained and there's not a great risk. There isn't a, a yeah, I think the fact that, oh, I'm sorry, TJ, we're going to say more? I am going to go ahead on that one. No. I was going to say that is, um, that's something that's unique about the RCD and our partner, the NRCS, and enables us to do environmental work where others are not invited. The fact that we are not an advocacy group and we very carefully maintain that objectivity, our goal is to help people, wherever they are, whatever their values are, is to help people. We are invited onto properties where the water board, fish and game, fish and wildlife will not be invited. And it enables us to have a reach that I think otherwise, um, we get things done that otherwise wouldn't happen. Uh, so, Teacher, could you step up to the mic? Because these are not amplification microphones, uh, but they connect with the video. And if you're not at a microphone. Uh, yes. OK, good. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, so as Kelly said earlier, I'm the president of the board. So kind of speaking on behalf of the board, we're delighted with the job that Kelly has done. Uh, and we do want to see this information and understanding of the RCD get shared more widely so the community knows. Uh, the dams projects have been particularly interesting. Uh, she's, she or the RCD as a whole were called in to help over on the other side of the hill too where it's not in our boundary, but the stream between Menlo Park and Palo Alto has had a dam in it that uh, also was blocking the fish trying to migrate up the stream for spawning. We took that out two or three years ago, and that opened up another 40 miles or so of spawning uh, area for those fish. And so just a lot of different ways to do things. Uh, there's another category of projects, which is bringing people together to uh, kind of coordinate the planning process for more complex uh, environments, like the Pilocitos Creek that comes all the way down 92. And so the RCD has also played the role of of kind of shepherding those discussions along over a multi-year process with lots of organizations, lots of landowners and the like, and I think that's a role too that fits in this whole thing, this cooperative, uh, consultative nature of the, of the projects. So I guess I'd like to end by also encouraging people if they want to be involved in any way, we're happy to have people become volunteers or associate members of the RCD or in some of the ways. If you're interested in these kinds of projects, and you'd like to see if there's a way to help out, let us know. Contact us. Yeah, to that end, I'm going to, um, before I leave tonight, I'm going to leave some of my business cards. And, um, and I was going to ask if I can leave a piece of paper so that if people want to be on our distribution list for newsletters or for board meetings or are interested in volunteering, we can um, you know, accommodate that. Yes, please do. Leonard. knows this, but twice a year I stand here and try and recruit volunteers for uh, Snapshot Day and First Flush, and I'm it not never surprised. seems to work. So maybe you can use this opportunity to <laughs> try better on the recruitment and explain why you Want need volunteers beat the drum? and what the, you know, what the value of those two programs is. Absolutely. So um, First Flush is the first big storm event of the year. Rain washes across the landscape and picks up all of the pollutants that have been building up across the landscape during the dry season. Those pollutants wash into creeks and into storm pipes and um, to beaches and to the ocean. And it gives us sort of a, a, a point in time that's basically your worst case scenario to give you the picture of what's happening on the landscape, what pollutants are loading. It's almost like it's our version of Mavericks, you know? It's, it's, we're all waiting for the event. When is it gonna be called? Inevitably, Leonard, is it almost always in the middle of the night? Um, so if you are really excited about crawling around in storm drains in the middle of the night in the rain, you too can be a volunteer for this program. How's that for a sell? So, um, no, you're not crawling around in storm drains, I'm exaggerating. But, but what we do need is we need a team of people who can come, and it, actually we're gonna be recruiting for this soon, so it's really timely. We need a team of people who can come to a, a training, usually in the late summer, to learn how to take a sample, and then be available so that when we 
when we call the event, they can come out and um, go to their assigned sites and they work in a team. It's, it's very easy to do, it's doable, it's fun. And, um, and you're contributing to a, a really important set of data about what the water quality situation is in, on the coast in San Mateo County. And we rely on volunteers to do it. It's not, we don't have the staffing to do that. It's essential to have volunteers. Snapshot Day is a different event. It's not um, associated necessarily with rain, but there's a, there's a few locations where we take sort of a snapshot of the water quality profile on a given day annually to build um, a database and understand how it's changing over time compared to baseline. For both of these things, we need volunteers. And it's not an ongoing commitment. It's not a huge time commitment. It's fun. Um, they're, they're really cool people who do it, who are really committed. And it provides a really important set of data and has guided management decisions. This is how we know where to focus our efforts and what to focus our efforts on. <clears throat> no, that we haven't established a minimum age requirement and we have had young people come out typically with their parents. It's not something we've navigated a whole lot, but we've had families come out and do that. We also had families with the Pillar Point Harbor study. We had, a, we had over 100 volunteers for that. And we've had um, families do that. We have also talked with schools about it, but it's difficult because we don't know if it's going to happen during a school day or in the middle of the night and how they would um, be transported and that sort of thing. So we haven't navigated that. But, um, but young people with their parents, I think, would be something that we'd really the, encourage. The, the kids more common for Snapchat, Snapchat day. Great. Well, Kelly, so I just want to say, and also TJ, I would love to hear more about RCP, RCD projects. So the next time you have a big project or your update, please contact uh, the MCC. And, Thank and you. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, I see you've got the web page up. I do. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. One we can all get behind. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right? That's Feels that's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up on the agenda is the roundabout feasibility at Cypress and Highway 1. And Dave and Lisa are going to tell us all about that. So we have a draft letter posted on the website. If you're watching this video later, you can find it there. Uh, it's out on the table. And uh, basically, we, at our meeting uh, April 13th, we had a four-page letter that we discussed and comment on the Comprehensive Transportation Management Plan, or CTMP. Uh, stage they're at and there was a large part of the letter was about um, our support for roundabouts, their benefits and specifically um, since this uh, report that we were commenting on proposed uh, the ultimate solution for Moss, for the mid coast was two traffic signals in Moss Beach, one at Cypress and one at California. Um, now we had in 2012 <coughs> we, we saw the output from the safety and mobility study and uh, where roundabouts were proposed for Moss Beach. Um, there was mixed review among the public at that time. I think at the meeting there were nine people who didn't like the idea and eight people who did and all the rest of the people didn't say anything in particular about it. But since 2012, I sense the, um, the general uh, knowledge about roundabouts and the perception and all has, has been changing and, and it was clear at the meeting a month ago that when faced with this prospect of two traffic signals in Moss Beach, all of a sudden roundabouts look like a way better idea. So uh, that was the gist of our letter at the time and it was at that meeting where we first saw the um, roundabout feasibility study, uh, study. Um, it was a memo, uh, for a roundabout at Cyprus. And, related to the big wave project. Now part of the, the big wave approvals included um, that they, not for the wellness center, but once they want to build one of their business park buildings, they need to either um, provide signalized intersection or a roundabout at Cypress. 
uh, Caltrans now requires anytime you're considering an intersection improvement that you first consider a roundabout. So uh, my sense of what it says in, in our letter today is that that Sandus report that saying that the roundabout at Cyprus was not feasible was sort of like, oh, here we've checked the box, we, we've looked at it, we, it's not feasible. But that it wasn't in any way in depth and, and basically we don't believe it. We, we need something more solid to believe it's really not feasible there and we would like a study to, to look at it which will in a positive way, to look at it in depth and say, how can we make this work? A better solution for Cyprus. And uh, the concern is that Big Wave is, has, I don't know their timeline, but clearly they've got their planning approvals and they're moving along in their process and they, they're going to want to put in a roundabout sooner rather than uh, a signal, sooner rather than later, and that we were, uh, I was afraid we were going to miss the process and this would happen and not only would we have have all the traffic from Big Wave, but not only that, their project, if they put a signal at Cyprus, would then affect the future of Moss Beach, which was kind of hard to take. So um, that was the urgency of writing this letter. Uh, this summarizes the Big Wave conditions um, and the importance of, that basically this intersection will Um, if it's a, if it's a, if we get a roundabout there, then we have something here in the mid coast. To, that maybe there'll be more roundabouts, or maybe, or maybe not. But if we get a signal there, we will never get any roundabouts in the mid coast. It seems to me, and so this seemed urgent. So uh, we had in our previous letter we had listed the benefits of roundabouts, and that's included here as well. Uh, And basically, so we're asking that the county do a more comprehensive study of the roundabout at Cyprus, and that it's so important to us that the MCC would contribute money toward that, and uh, that's the other part of this agenda item to, to approve that. Um, Dave, do you have anything to add? Um. Not a whole lot. I mean, I have talked to a number of people about traffic along the mid coast and in Moss Beach in general. And um, the first thing everybody says is, I don't want anything that will slow down traffic on Highway One, make my commute longer, shopping longer. And then it's, oh, but but the county wants to put signals in, which was sort of the conclusion most people drew from the CTMP. And all of a sudden, people were much more interested, as you said, in the roundabout. And I think we've seen some data from various locations around the state. I spent some time looking up what Caltrans has been doing with roundabouts. And Caltrans now has roundabouts on actually on the highway in four locations in California. And District 4 is pretty much the only one that has not considered them for any other highways. There are also quite a few that are adjacent as part of interchanges, um, several up in Truckee uh, and other places where uh, the signals were seen as being uh, slowing down traffic through the town, um, but Caltrans thought they were necessary for traffic on and off the highway, particularly left turns. So the roundabout solved traffic problems there. Truckee in particular, um, along Highway 89 going north, uh, sorry, I believe going north, and, uh, has plans for putting in three more roundabouts to, and removing signals at those locations because they have been found to be so effective. Uh, there's also in, on Highway 1 up in Fort Bragg a roundabout at a sim an intersection similar to Cypress. Uh, that one's a little bit uh, larger, it's two lanes, uh, but it's a similar thing where uh, most of the traffic comes in on the highway a fair amount off one side of the intersection, almost nothing off the other. So it's actually a somewhat elliptical roundabout uh, to fit the terrain, and that's perhaps what we might wind up with at Cypress. But um, it, it does look as though it's very practical to put a roundabout at that location and would not slow down traffic very much when there's no cross traffic. Also on the website, I've, uh, for today's meeting, there's links to um, 
the Federal Highway Associ Association, is, uh, their blurb on roundabouts is also a, a ARP, American Association of Retired People, promoting roundabouts, and then the link to Caltrans, which it's a larger document, but it, it's, it, 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 under, it explains why they're a good thing, and also it's an, it has an inventory of the roundabouts throughout California. And you uh, say that organization, I think, is the Federal Highway Traffic Safety Administration, so that they know what they're talking about. It's worth checking out those two documents that we have posted that have a lot of good information. Yeah, they are definitely safer, and that's the benefits are listed here in the letter, too, and we've 75% uh, fewer injury collisions. It's interesting to note that in the Mid-Coast, the most accidents happen at the two intersections that have signals. So, you know, we're talking about putting in another intersection and then having more accidents. Anyway, uh, also there's a memo there from a, um, someone that Len contacted, and I was hoping he could speak to that if he wished, or maybe you could go first under public comment or whatever, or maybe now, I don't know, whatever you... Um, yeah, well, we'll see what you got to say. <coughs> So in looking at the roundabout, I have uh, just from personal acquaintance, a friend who's a transportation engineer in Florida where they've done a lot of work with roundabouts. He's worked with them a lot, both as an engineer for a town, a city, and now with a transportation consulting group to sort of look at the situation. He's also visited me here, so he certainly has a certain feel for the area. But basically, I mean, and it's a complex area to dig into. He has a friend of his who he's worked with professionally who's also an experienced roundabout designer and evaluator. So basically just asked him to take a look at it. And it was a situation where it asked for you know, some feedback to get a sense of both what, where the letter left us and where might want to go from there. I think a couple of the salient points he raised, uh, and it's attached. One is at, at a high level, it isn't necessarily clear, it seems somewhat clear, but this is subjective from my end, that in looking at the design problem, the designer didn't, they didn't go in any particular depth just to look at how one might design it, <clears throat> raising some points about that. There's also, if you look at the traffic flow, some definite considerations that go deeper into the data, which they're certainly capable of looking at and evaluating to a certain extent, and that conversation has been carried forward, but the, the bottom line was I think, you know, certainly at a, at, a, at a level of a comment by an expert, there's a lot to look at there that makes it seem like a feasible option and other things to look at in detail and really not the kind of things you're going to make any progress on if you don't have somebody doing it with a professional background to look at it, but looking at it from the positive perspective about how can we get past this. So that's the... And that letter is on the MCC website as well. Thank you for that. And, um, Lisa, I have a... I just, for you and Dave, I have a question I think might be tickling the minds of people, and it's a kind of a higher level question, but we just had the CTMP, and now we're asking the county to take another look. How, what, how, why do you feel that, that they would take another look when they just came to us with the CTMP designs that are clearly not favoring roundabouts? How is this going to... Um... Two different projects. The CTMP is to develop a planning document. There's, even if they come through and, and continue on with these two traffic signals in this, in this CTMP, it doesn't mean they'll, or when, or if, or whatever, it will be built. It's the Big Wave project, this project is going to be built, and it's going to be a signal or a roundabout, and soon. And regardless of the timeline or the, or the results of the CTMP, uh, and it's, that's a set of consultants the county hired to do that plan, the CTMP, and, uh, and it will go through its process, getting approved at the county, and then going to the Coastal Commission, and maybe getting approved, maybe not, whatever. It will wend its way. And in the meantime, uh, Big Wave's going to want to perhaps build their thing and put something there. So that's why this is separate, and it's urgent. And I would add, the CTMP study is a very conceptual study. And I think the consultants covered the alternatives they were more familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah. By obviously, there are not a lot of traffic engineers in the state of California that are familiar with roundabouts. Um, so they tend to get short shrift 
Um, but you know, I think they were starting to get that feedback, and I, obviously, if this goes the way we hope it will, it would um, probably feed into the preferred alternatives for CTMP. But then we still have to remember that's just a conceptual study. So we're talking about here an actual design study. Uh, Big Wave is not only required to have these plans, they're required to have Caltrans approve the plans before the buildings can be occupied. So they have to be real plans with all the standards that, that Caltrans requires, and that's why we want to get this now. I'm sorry if I'm being redundant for people that already know this, but I would like to ask Lisa and Dave again. Um, other than a letter from the MCC, what, what chance is there for people on the mid-coast to participate in this process? I, I was surprised when I saw this document appear in front of me on the, at the, <laughs> the last meeting. I mean, wh where did this come from? How, what? And yeah. how, how are we connected to this thing that's going to happen right in the middle of our neighborhood? Well, we had, um, actually, I, I wrote to Steve right after our meeting and Steve said, Monowitz. Steve Monowitz, and said, well, well, whoa, whoa, wait, you know, when is this going to be decided? And is, this is getting away from us. And, uh, you know, because, you know, what would be the public process? You know, if they just discount this roundabout right at the get-go and we don't have any say, that would be unfortunate. So. Um, so that's the quest question is in this first paragraph. Uh, I know it requires a coastal development permit, but it would be nice to get this sort of, to explore this fully before we even get there. Uh, and so the idea would be first, you know, to appeal to the county to do a more comprehensive study on the roundabout or, or let us do it or let us participate. Uh, when I say participate, I'm, I'm assuming that the county planning would, um, you know, hire a consultant or, or whatever they would do, but perhaps it would have a little, some say in who they choose or, 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 or whatever. I don't know. It's a first step to see because I didn't get any reply back from um, Steve Arnold's. Thank you, Lisa. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, just that the, the focus of this would be different. Rather than considering a roundabout, it would be how can we make a roundabout work? Mm -hmm. that, that is a big difference in direction. Yes. By chipping in money, we would have some say in how that RFP was written and, and who they uh, choose to fulfill it. Great. Um, I'd like to open it up now to members of the public if you'd like to make a comment on this. Um, uh, Leonard, come first, and then Bill uh, after that, and then Carl. Yep. Used of mincing words, and tonight's not going to be one of those times. Um, you know, most of us are familiar with the expression rent a geologist and rent a biologist. Well, Big Wave has rented a traffic engineer here. They told the traffic engineer what they wanted the conclusion to be, and we have a bogus report that's just BS. The one page letter is total BS. I haven't uh, I didn't realize that the full report is linked on the MCC website, so I haven't looked at it. But if you look at the um, diagram that was circulated, I think, at the last meeting here, uh, I got Ellie to email it to me, and so I have the one-page letter that I don't think was circulated with that diagram. The, there are so many things wrong there. The, the thing, to me, looks like it was intentionally rigged to force the conclusion that a roundabout can't be done there, and that's just utter BS. The Caltrans right away, for years I've been saying it's 150 feet, it turns out it's 160 feet in El Granada, so I pulled the plat map for Moss Beach, and it looked to me like it was wider, but Lisa double-checked it, and Lisa insists that it's also only 160 feet there. But I fail to see how a 115-foot diameter roundabout can't fit in a 160-foot right away. Somebody didn't go to um, grade school arithmetic class. And it's the traffic engineer that cooked the books in that report. Um, so Lisa mentioned this requires a CDP. That CDP will be appealable to the Coastal Commission. If nobody else appeals it, I will if it doesn't say roundabout. 
And the MCC should insist that an EIR has to be done regarding what to do for traffic at that intersection. Because the EIR has to evaluate all alternatives. And that's where you get the evaluation where they have to prove that a traffic signal is a better solution than a roundabout, which everybody knows today, you know, current knowledge is a traffic signal is always the worst solution. Uh, in fact, in most cases, it's worse than doing nothing because all it does is slow down traffic. That's why a lot of people call it stop light. They don't call it go light. So um, if you look at the diagram that was circulated, they put in what they call a bypass lane cutting across some of the private property on the north northwest corner there. But if you move the whole roundabout to the center of the Caltrans right away, instead of putting it on the edge where the current intersection is, the highway is built on the west side of the right of way. So move the intersection with the the roundabout to the center of the right of way. And all of a sudden it fits. There's no need to acquire more property. That bypass lane isn't needed anyway. It was just thrown in as uh, a justification for saying the roundabout can't work. Um, there's a, a, an old style traffic circle up here. Uh, what is it, three blocks up here? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Plaza Balboa. Uh, so it's Balboa and Columbus. Um, anybody can drive around there and see how nicely it works. And that's ancient technology. Roundabouts are much more modern thinking on how to do uh, essentially the same concept. So I totally support everything Lisa said, totally support what's in the letter. And uh, MCC really needs to strongly take the lead here and insist that there has to be an unbiased evaluation of the roundabout. My feeling, you know, since, since I, um, I don't ever have a problem with telling the naked emperor that he has no clothes, Big Wave paid to get this conclusion because a roundabout will take longer to design and cost more to implement. And, and they don't want that. So they just want a quick fix so they can pocket the money and get out of town. And if you don't believe me that their intent is to get out of town, the ink wasn't even dry on the approval when the project was listed for sale. So the proponents of the project don't have, uh, of, of the office park part, I'm not speaking to the, the wellness center because I don't think any of this is ever going to be built on the way. That's the one thing I disagree with Lisa on. I don't think that's ever going to be built. But their greed, their selfishness, should not impact 25,000 people who live here and hundreds of thousands of people who visit here. We cannot afford to have a traffic signal there. It has to be a roundabout. And, and by the way, the Cypress right away for the last block there, when, when you go further up, you, you, you end up with a weird situation because of... Let's go. <laughs> is, that, is that mine? <laughs> oh, I think uh, uh, Siri has had enough. Leonard, no. Uh, <laughs> that, that sounded like way is. The, 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 <laughs> because of the um, rural zoning around the Cypress, uh, whatever that place is called, um, yeah, the, the, the right of way there is only half the street width, and the rest of it is, is on their property, uh, what should have been the right of way. But the last block with the um, uh, uh, non rural zoning, it's probably uh, uh, residential zoning, the right of way for Cypress is 50 feet. So there's plenty of room there. You could widen Cypress, and, and this, this should be done you know, tomorrow. Widen Cypress, put in a dedicated left turn to northbound lane, and uh, a dedicated right turn lane, and that could be done very easily in the existing right of way. And that's a quick fix. It should be done immediately while they're still dilly-dallying around here trying to figure out how to force a traffic signal on us. That I don't think I've heard one person support the traffic signal. And you might want to note that in the letter. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Bill? I have both on the one slip. Cut back. 
Uh, yeah, um, Bill Kim West Beach. I, I I really like Lisa's letter. I think it's important for the council um, to keep pushing for a roundabout. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into all the stuff that uh, Leonard talked about there. I think it's just the easiest thing to say without describing malice to any property owners or anything else is it's always going to be cheaper to put in a traffic circle than engineer. Or excuse me, a traffic light than engineer a circle, so naturally that's the low hanging fruit and project managers get bonuses for keeping the price down. So, you know, that's just the flow of the machine. And so you sort of have to fight a little bit to, to stop that. Um, I think the idea that the possibility of five stoplights between California Street and uh, Highway 92 and Highway 1 is just a non-starter, and as I said, the one at Terrace is already going in, and then the other, you know, Roosevelt. the other, the uh, Roosevelt's on the other side, 92. So it's, no. In, oh no, Roosevelt is on this side. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. I keep thinking that's it. Anyway, that's that's an extra half hour if uh, you know when they fall out of being in sync, which will be like the second power outage that we have. They'll be out of sync for God knows how long. So anyway, so, so the cost is going to be probably higher. The end result, especially because they're looking at two in Mars Beach, I, I think when Lisa talked about the concept of a traffic flow for the community, that makes so much sense because at both ends, you have people coming from a fairly wide open space doing 50 plus miles an hour into a shorter space where uh, in Moss Beach especially, uh, the population is bifurcated by Highway 1, so you get a lot of cross traffic in both directions, going to the ocean, going to the two services that we have. And that really has to be taken into consideration. How do you slow that down? Because we all know, in, at least in our short time here, there's been quite a few serious pedestrian car accidents. Um, uh, and, and you know, I've lived with this since my kids were real small, and even now, when my wife and I try and cross, it's, it's, it's very difficult at California Highway 1. So, and, the, and the cars are doing 50 plus at that point. Um, very seldom do we have a backup, you know, because there are no stoplights. Uh, you don't get the backup until you get down closer to Capistrano. Uh, and then they start to back up, but usually it doesn't go much past 3 0 Cafe unless it's a really bad day. So the elimination, I think, the idea of one traffic circle so p people can get their feet wet and then they say, oh, wow, this is really good and it works. And then maybe we could actually eliminate a lot of these other traffic stoplights that we have here and just have a constant flow. I'd rather flow at 35 miles an hour than stop five minutes at every light. Um, so that's the other thing. That, um, not on this topic, but it made me wonder. So you mentioned you have $5,000 um, that you would like to put in. Because I don't even think that buys a consultant's toenail, but you, you, might do, you might do better. But what it made me realize, and I really hate to say this, but um, I've never seen a treasurer's report for the um, MCC. And as a public agency, when you have money like that, shouldn't you like, have a regular treasurer's report at every meeting? It's posted uh, with this meeting. There's a link to it next yeah. to the Oh, oh okay. It's, it's, yeah, but it's never actually it's mentioned. It's always in, there under yeah. the finance committee. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not always on the way. Our expenditures are so... So uh, I'm just, just I'm used to seeing a treasurer's report on the consent agenda and blah blah blah, and it just sort of like, well, I forgot they even had money. So. No, we did. Uh, in fact, I saw one for I didn't mean to get it off topic. 2015, and then there was a partial one, I believe, for this year associated with this agenda item. Okay. But good point, um, <coughs> Carl. Um, it's never pleasant to talk about the lesser of two evils. Uh, let's face it, whichever goes in, the roundabout or a traffic light, it's going to be worse than what we have now. These roundabouts only work with up to a limited number of cars going through them. The one at the south end of Fort Bragg on Highway 1 gets plugged up whenever there's weekend traffic up there. There's a backup. I've been through it twice now on weekends. There's a backup from that roundabout, which is very similar to this roundabout. What, on our, and the traffic up there, by the way, on Highway 1 is nothing like what we get on weekends here. 
this is going to be a clog. If it's a roundabout, it's going to be a clog in the middle of the highway in Moss Beach. And if there are two of them, there will be two clogs in the middle of the highway. What comes out of this is going to be worse than what we have now. There's no question about that. How did we get there? The approval, with plenty of objections about the access to the project of the Big Wave project. This is all of the county's making. And they overrode the vast majority of comments from people who live here on the coast side, numerous ones to these access, concerning these access points. And now we're getting stuck with their mistake. And this fries me. My wife almost won't go out on, a, on the road on the weekend anymore with me. Because every place I go, I'm complaining about a bad decision that has been made. <laughs> about it. I can't stop myself. Because you're going through it over and over and over again, and it didn't need to be. And so I don't think we should ever for a minute forget that the county is doing this to us, and we're going to end up worse off than we are now. That said, yeah, the roundabouts are better than a stoplight. We know that. I mean, we knew that. We fought, I forget how long through the MCC, we have fought over the details of this uh, Capist no, not Capistrano, Coronado light. And <laughs> the only thing that saved it from not being any worse than it is, which is awful, was the fact that Half Moon Bay did not go in on their access, on their side of the road. It would have been worse than what we have now. But Half, Half Moon Bay at the time had some city officials that didn't go in. So the other thing about roundabouts is I have never heard anything at a Mid-Coast Council meeting that gave, gives actual studies and actual numbers for what would be done. And believe me, pie-in-the-sky ideas from traffic engineers very often don't work out. And most recently, up until last October, we had a year and a half of horrendous delays and a new bridge being put in in Pacifica. For the purpose, the stated purpose of lengthening the road over the creek, but the real purpose of that highway there was to widen the road. All they have to do is knock out the cement barrier uh, between the roadway and the path that they put in, and they've got four lanes. It's a more or a little bit of this four laning of the coast side that Caltrans has chosen to do step by step by step. And <laughs> uh, the traffic engineer at that time in Pacifica said there would be a 30-second delay from, from the detour that had to be put in for a year and a half. There were up to one hour and 45 minute delays coming from the north. I don't know what the longest one going from the south re on cars returning north in the evening was, but they were backed up th through Moss Beach a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And that was a professional traffic study. You can't believe these people unless they can get down to some good data from comparing apples to apples. Now, otherwise, I don't believe any of their stuff. Their stuff is done to please the people who are hiring them not to look at actual situations or to please the community, which is the one, are the people who are going to have to live with it, or my poor wife who has to listen to me <laughs> all the time forever on this stuff when it gets done. So I don't think uh, we, oh, one, oh, just one other thing on the letter. It talks about putting this thing in bef before the construction is done on big wave. I don't care what they do on planning or whatever. On, on all of that. I would suggest that since it's going to be worse not to have it done before construction is done on Big Wave, because we don't know how much of it, whatever, is going to be done there ever. But we will start suffering as soon as the roundabout is built, if we can get a roundabout. So why not have the letter say something like, <laughs> the, the planning will be in place or whatever before construction can be done on Big Wave. But why put us through maybe forever if nothing gets done down there very quickly, of having our clog on the highway. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. I'm sorry. Sir? One thing, like, nobody can hear you on the video if you're not up to the microphone. Second of all, we're not having a back and forth. If you want to make a public comment, fill out a speaker slip, come on up, and you can ask your question then. And that would be the best way to be heard. Just make a, a reply to Carl on the subject of the big wave construction schedule. The conditions of approval lay out in specific detail at what stage in their development they have to be at what stage in the intersection. And that can't be changed now. 
So, and, and Caltrans will also wow. have some say in that, in that they may say, oh, well, no, wait till later. But I don't think that's a public decision anymore. Right. But yeah. I, the, the point here being just to, they're trying to take the round out off the table right at the start. We're saying, hold on, yeah. hold on, that's all. And, and, and the, question, the answer to the question, why not, as it went all the way through the Coastal Commission. And the final answer on when the, the traffic mitigation is built rests with Caltrans. Caltrans makes the decision on when it gets built. So it isn't necessarily built when, if and when the first business building is open. It's what Caltrans thinks the traffic situation is at that point. But the plans have to be approved the specific word my, my concern was we would get something built before anything demands that it be there you know and have to go through years of the you know a year or two or whatever of and, having and our but out. caltrans is the one that makes the decision we can yeah. lobby them at that time mm -hmm. the second paragraph of the letter summarizes the conditions of approval that relate to the timing of this intersection and that's kind of what we're uh, that's set in stone, and it also says that Caltrans will, you know, can. The second paragraph of the letter. James Gartrell. Yeah, so uh, I have just one quick comment to make, and that is I too have seen the huge long delays for um, the Cypress intersection, and I too would endorse the dedicated left turn lane because I believe a lot of people, a lot of backup there is due to right turn people that can't make the right turn because of the drainage ditch that exists on the right hand side of the highway. I'd also be interested in and in, in, um, understanding, is it Russell? Carl, excuse me, Carl. I'd also be under, I would like to know Carl's feelings on whether or not he thinks a dedicated left turn lane and right turn lane would be a, uh, a good alternative. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, Bill, did you already come on? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, come on up. Yes. I forgot to say one thing when I was up here, and Carl reminded me. Um, and, it, and it is about um, kind of the, the reply seemed to just be ex cathedra. This is the decision without, you know, Laura's not here to ask for it. Where is the data? Okay. Um, when I was in school, the, the, the answer to my math puzzles and uh, physics classes was you get five or ten percent for the answer and you get eighty to ninety percent for showing your work mm -hmm. so we really should ask them to show the work I mean this is just queuing theory you know what's the rate of cars coming into the, you know from this spigot and that spigot and that I mean it's not rocket science and they I don't know if they've done any kind of the, the, tra study. the traffic count estimations are in both the CTMP and the big wave studies I have to say, I spent a lot of time going through all the data that we do have, okay. and it is posted here with the meeting materials, and it goes back to 20, 2011, Nelson Nygaard with the Safety Mobility, they had analysis of the roundabout there, uh, and the Hexagon report for Big Wave, I, that was a very long report, I pulled out the stuff that related to Cyprus, the data's there, they used the same existing data that was taken for the CTMP in June 2014, uh, and those sheets are in there. But you know, okay, so that's good. So we had, yeah, I would envision you would give that to the traffic consultant or whatever. But I mean, it's like I can pull this all together until I feel like my head's going to explode. But I, I'm still not a traffic engineer, and I don't understand the, the tables that you know. I can just say that look, here's this, here's this data, and here's these cursory conclusions. And I don't, you know, we want to see something that really looks at it in a positive way and shows the work and all that. That's what we're asking for. Okay. Uh, it, I, I, to be honest, I, I did not see that, um, but I wasn't looking for it. I'm working on other things right now. But I think um, if, if you can't understand it, then what's the chances that the Board of Supervisors <laughs> understood it too? Sorry, Evan. Um, but, but I think it behooves them to prove the point and they should be able to simplify that so people can understand. Um, I, I'll go back and take a look at it. I, you know, it's been years since I've dealt with queuing theory, but it, I think it's, it's odd. It's not complete. We need another traffic yeah. engineer to do but, it right. Well, and then, and then, and then it's also, it's no matter what, because the predicting the future is going to be a supposition. And I don't know if you even did something as simple of 
how many cars are going to be filling up those office spaces, and then how many are going to go north. And I, but don't shake your head yet. There. I'm sure they have numbers, yeah. but I want to know the bases in reality. Are these numbers that they went back and retrofitted after they understood what conclusion they wanted? Four different these? estimates depending on what kind of buildings they build and what mix they build in the buildings. That would be the hexagon report. That would be that's hexagon. Yes. Okay. That's the we look at the size of the parking lot. That'll give you an idea. Yeah, no, I, I remember what the, the number of spaces were. It was big. Yeah. But it, anyway, um, the, data, <laughs> the data is suspect. That's all I'm saying. Sure. Uh, one yeah. second, Leonard. Len and then Leonard. Yeah, I'm from Missouri, <laughs> So, uh, Ben Erickson from El Granada. Um, I spoke earlier about providing some information from professional engineers about this who were positively disposed to the options. So, I think if you even read that, you get some feeling for the resource you can get. I'm, uh, as a person who helped as a treasurer establish this fund that now exists, it really has never been used to do anything as an active process. So, I also think this is an interesting, innovative use of the funds. I mean, I, I certainly support and understand Bill's notion that if you're spending it, you want to be both careful in your review and, and look at it. But on the other hand, it, it should be, and I don't want to be overly nice about bringing it to the county either, but you know, we're, we're looking for positive leverage to look at our view, not out of their sight, because part of the point is, if we were to go over there and spend this on our own and didn't come in with this report and they'd never seen it, that's not going to get us there. You had a good example from Kellex of what happens if you get all the parties there together, you know, from a government body, which we are, so I think it's a great opportunity to do that. When I last stood up after Connect the Coast, I talked about, so then the next step is really try to get a good circulation study for Moss Beach, the big picture, you know, a year down the road, but then this came to light. So I, I certainly agree with the council's action that you've got to bring it forward. Nobody's looking for unseemly haste, but on the other hand, Part of this goes back to as Big Wave was built, and I don't think anybody in this room was a proponent of Big Wave, but we did then and was put in. If you're going to put Big Wave in, you have to have mitigation for the traffic. I would therefore point out to the council, too, that if you're even, somebody's even thinking about large amounts of housing in the other end of Moss Beach, I haven't heard anybody say, well, yes, there'll be traffic, so what do you pay for that? So if, if Mid Coast Housing is coming to talk about their proposal, they should certainly state up front that they're, as part of their project, putting in funding to do it. And you shouldn't view that as a collapse or sort of capitulating to the project. That's just a safety measure you want in place. These are things that happen 10 and 20, 30 years down the road, but we take the actions now so you have that option available. Thanks, Len. Leonard? One thing that I mentioned in an email to Lisa, but I was reminded of it by Carl's comment about um, Fort Bragg. I guess I'm going to have to go visit there and see how that one works. 115 foot diameter roundabout is what's being proposed for Cyprus in the drawing. 160 foot right of way, that leaves 45 feet left over. You can 20 years from now, turn that into a two-lane <laughs> roundabout, and it still easily fits in the existing right-of-way. And the two-lane roundabout can process substantially more. It's probably nowhere near double, but um, it can process substantially more than a one-lane roundabout. And uh, by the way, there's one roundabout that I've driven on that actually scares me, and it's in Long Beach. It's about five lanes wide. And the way I come in one direction, I have to exit about halfway around, a third of the way around. You, you, for some reason, you get injected in the center when you come in the direction that I came, and then you have to exit on the right and get across five lanes and a third of the way around. But you can build big roundabouts, and that is a big one. So two lanes easily fits here, no problem. They just don't want to make it work. Thank you, Leonard. Dan? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the letter as written. Okay, one second. Does anybody else from the public want to make a comment uh, on the letter? Okay. 
the letter um, to Supervisor Horsley and Steve Monowitz roundabout feasibility at Cypress and Highway 1. Are you taking these as two separate actions or one or Yes. The two, the two uh, intended in, outcomes? As in the agenda. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, you wanted to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the letter as written. Second. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to discuss that motion? Okay, so we have a motion on the table to accept the letter as written. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 5-0. Dave seconded. Okay, the letter is approved. 5-0. Great. Okay. Okay, next on the agenda. Wait. Oh, whoops. We have another, another on the agenda. Oh, Number right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Somebody needs to make a motion. Uh, I will make a motion to uh, approve the expenditure up to $5,000 to contribute to a traffic study for a roundabout at Cypress Avenue. Anybody second that? Second. Okay, hold that thought for one second. I just want to say that I want to echo what uh, I believe Len brought up, which is I believe this is a innovative and important proposal to use these MCC funds in this way. And the reason I feel that is one, um, where you, we are literally putting our money where our mouth is, which is uh, this is money that we are wanting to spend in order to generate some kind of better outcome for the community. I can't think of a better way to spend the money. Um, two, you know, we've been carrying a balance for a while, which is great. I definitely like to be um, fiscally responsible, but um, this is a good use of the funds because it we now have a financial stake in it. We are a stakeholder financially in this study, in this project. And so it's and it's not our own project, but we come up with a project, we hand it to county and they, you know, great, that was nice. We are looking to to partner with the county on this with our bringing our own funds to the table. We want to be part of this and however you want to say it, this is our buy-in, okay, this is our ante, and I think it's an excellent use, and I really commend uh, Lisa and Dave for, for having the vision to come up with this idea, so those are my comments on that. Does anybody else have any comments? Uh, Claire? Yeah, I certainly agree in principle. I'm not sure I completely follow what, where this money is going. Uh, what's the pro what is the mechanism between our writing a check and there being a study? Uh, we wouldn't necessarily write any check. Basically, we're in the letter here. There's no dollar amount. Up uh, to five thousand. But yeah, we just specific. offered to contribute funds to whom? To the county for this study, and uh, so it demonstrates our commitment, our the importance that we attach to this, and so. The, the other uh, motion here to approve uh, up to 5,000. So that's sort of setting the ceiling there. That's our internal decision. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, what we would actually be. Maybe they would say, well, gee, that's a very nice of you to offer. We'll, we'll do this. Or, gee, that's great. How about, I mean, we don't know. But um, clearly, if, if we vote for this, this is what we're willing to do. And it, it demonstrates how we feel about it. Other comments from the council? Okay, we have a motion on the table that has been seconded. Carl? We have a little public discussion on this $5,000 thing. Yeah, come on up, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, could the letter for the $5,000 or the offer or whatever be worded in such a way that the MCC gets a seat at the table? That's, what, that's where you participate comes in. We would like to participate. In and what way? Just financially or <laughs> have a seat at the table? Okay. Um, I had a conversation with Supervisor Horsley about this. He suggested that wording. He suggested that wording, but <laughs> did it give you a seat at the table? <laughs> he said he would support roundabouts. Uh, yeah. Let's face it, want? we don't trust Horsley. He it's voted all, no, wait. No, wait. <laughs> you know, he voted for the problem that creates the need for this discussion. You know, <laughs> let's not uh, get carried away with this, <laughs> you know. It's, could we have a seat at the table, like we being the big coast? 
during the discussion of the consultant or whatever is going to be needed to get, right. get more we, information. If we send this letter asking to participate and offering to contribute funds, mm -hmm. then the next step is a discussion of how that would work. That's why the motion is phrased as not to exceed. Yeah. And if we decide that we are being pushed out of the discussion, then we won't contribute any money. Yeah, we can revisit this. And I think that the w I appreciate your comment. Like one sec, though. I appreciate your comments, Carl. I think that the letter has been um, deftly worded in the sense, like up to five thousand. We're not committing any dollar amount, but we're leaving that open of like, okay, we we're making the entree here, and depending on the uh, response to this entree, we go to the next level, which I you know is maybe using words like demand or insist or things like that. But right now, I think we want to like get this idea out there and get it in the pipeline. And then, the ne as Lisa was saying, then the next step, we tighten up a little bit. Bill? Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys doing this. I'm just trying, uh, as Lynn pointed out, when we finally got the county to give us the budget, I forget how many years ago, I recall there were restrictions on how it gets used. I'm sure Lisa has done her homework. It's very specific. Okay. Uh, they, uh, money that we have left over can be used as we see fit for the good of the community. Okay, then. That sounds perfect to me. That's, I just couldn't remember. I just remember there's a whole a bunch it of stuff. It doesn't have to be for stamps and envelopes. Okay. And then remember? the, <laughs> that's, that's good. The internet connection is, is way better. <laughs> but um, good. Uh, I was worried about that. And then the, the other thing, of course, is um, uh, I certainly hope that they don't see this kind of um, creative use uh, and for the community as some reason to ever cut your budget in the future. But you know, that will be, uh, remain to be seen. And then one last reminder, uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, supervisor races going on. Uh, one uh, uh, for Daly City and, and what have you. And it would be good because even though Supervisor Horsley is our supervisor, um, it would be good to get to know some of the other supervisors because eventually all these things go before the board, you need three votes. So as much as we work closely with Supervisor Horsley, pay attention to the races, pay attention who's in there, and you know, I think we need to start lobbying more if we, if we want to get better action. Thank you, Bill. Okay, any other comments? Okay, we have a motion currently on the table that has been seconded uh, to um, authorize use of MCC funds up to a maximum of $5,000 to participate in a more in-depth Cypress roundabout feasibility analysis by the county. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, now we are on to the next item on the agenda, which is actually an item that was moved down from the consent agenda. This is the letter to Caltrans Roadside Vegetation Manager requesting preservation of ocean views from Highway 1. Let me just pull this letter out here. It's right here. Um, is there anybody on the council that would like to introduce yeah. this letter? Uh, oh, Lisa? Okay. Did, did I look completely oh. out of order? I told Kellex. No, I you're out of order. I know I am. <laughs> but Kellex has a sign-up list here. Yes. For those of you who want to be there for the first trains and all the other things, sign-up list right on the table and please consider it as you leave. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Good point. Okay. Uh, Lisa, can you introduce, uh, summarize this letter for us? Yes, okay. So I drafted this letter and there is a copy on the website um, if you're watching this later on the video so you will. and also there is a link there to an online petition on the uh, specific location of the between the lighthouse and 14th street uh, so basically i just want to stress that this letter is about vegetation only in the caltrans right of way that's all we're talking about and um, the, we hear this all the time about public ocean views and the council has 
worked very hard in, during my tenure to open up views at the end of Sea Cliff and 7th Street and on Beachway in, in uh, Moss Beach. Um, so I was, uh, I signed the online petition. Uh, that's another route to go, just uh, public support towards this issue. But basically, the, these few remaining public ocean views that we have right in the developed area are important to retain. That's the point. And we're, we're in danger, if, if nothing else, if Caltrain doesn't attend to these areas, the cypress trees and the pines, they seed themselves and, and basically it will soon be lost. And the, the letter simply asks here in the last sentence to, for Caltrans to improve and preserve public ocean views by removing shrubs and young trees from the Caltrans right away that will grow to block these views. Now, the, I had put in a couple of LCP policies here. Now, the second one, 8.5, is actually from uh, rural areas, so it, it doesn't apply in the urban area. Um, the, I don't know whether that's necessary anyway. Basically, we're just asking Caltrans to heed our plea, and they will do that or not, and maybe some places and maybe not others. But anyway, um, the Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, um, oh, a couple things on these specific locations. Between an 8th and 9th Street, the council had commented in 2012 or something like that about the landslide repair at that location, and we had hoped to get the hedge, the landscaping hedge that's not in front of the house, but along their driveway, that if you're driving by, you, you can't see the ocean, and yet it's right there. And uh, we had tried to get that removed in... Uh, together when they were approving the permits for the landscape and the landslide. And they said, well, there's no nexus between the hedge that's already existing and this project, so they wouldn't help us. So I thought, well, whatever. We'll give it another try here and put that in. And uh, then the location at the lighthouse is particularly, not only do you have one of these rare glimpses of the ocean as you drive by, but there's the lighthouse as well, the hostels there, the historical building. So it is choice. And when the houses were, as I understand it, and I haven't done the research on that when those permits were uh, approved for the houses that are below the road there, they're, they're totally below grade, but they were, um, part of the approval process was that they needed to be one story in order to retain the views from the scenic highway. And so, it, as we've seen elsewhere, as Leonard has mentioned, you know, you can even, uh, in El Granada, when the beach house was built, that was appealed to the Coastal Commission, and they made a move the whole uh, building to the north to leave a view corridor to the south where the spas are. And that was all done. They changed the whole design, and then they came in and planted cypress trees, so you can't see through there anyway. So it, it is an issue, and um, I just wanted to point out those other things. I'm, I'm inclined to... Uh, think the letter could be should be revised and so we could continue the item but since we're all here I think it would be very useful to hear from everybody so that that would go into whatever step we might take uh, at a later point. Does anybody on the council have any clarifying questions for Lisa? Okay. At this time, I want to open up public comment. If you have a comment on this topic, please fill out a speaker form, and uh, I will call on you in the order I get the forms. Okay, first up is Adrian Mallinger. Hi. Um, I'll try it. Hopefully my voice won't shake. This is not my normal place to be. Um, my name's Adrian. I live at 304 14th Street, Montero. Full disclosure, I live right across the street from where um, this topic is. And I have trees that I have planted um, for privacy and uh, to noise abatement. But I'm also an extremely good neighbor and I've kept them trimmed down. I just recently cut, trimmed down a um, bottle brush tree to keep it more in line with our roof line. The other ones might be a little furry right now, but I'm definitely on top of it. So much so to the point that since all of this has come up, I've even looked at 
the ones are in the, it's not technically a driveway, but it's our access to 14th Street. And I even looked at those and said, you know, maybe the ones on the top there, maybe those can be cut back. Maybe that's not really uh, safe for people to come around the corner. My point is, I'm very thoughtful about this. Um, I know all my neighbors up behind me, and uh, everybody's clear that I would never block anybody's view. Um, with that, um, I live there. Oh, and I know um, some of you might think their uh, cyber trees should grow to full height. Um, I look at them as like you would bonsai tree. They're trim and they have a purpose. And I think when something has a purpose, um, it actually becomes very beautiful. Um, I've lived there since 2000. And you mentioned the, the, uh, the Kleinans used to own the three houses that are on the ocean side of Highway 1. And when those were first proposed, they were going to be two-story with a walking attic, so basically going to be three stories. Um, the whole reason that those homes were one story is because of the public's right a view to the lighthouse and the corridor, but it's primarily the lighthouse there. Um, I do not have a right to view, none of us do. Um, but thankfully, the lighthouse did save everybody's view up on 14th, 13th, and a bit on 12th as well, and the public going through. And when that went through, it was finally approved, and I'm sorry, I just found out about this a few minutes before the meeting, so I didn't maybe pull the right documents, but I do have all the documents from um, all those hearings. I used to have them at the airport. And uh, I can give you a copy of this. It's not the latest, the last one, but part of the County of San Mateo Environmental Service Agency Planning and Building Division, the zoning hearing on those three homes that are down there. Uh, two points. Uh, to the extent feasible design development to minimize the blocking of views to or along the highway shoreline, from Highway 1 and other public viewpoints between Highway 1 and C. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I hope I got that right. Um, basically was saying that that's, the structures had to be low so people could see. And also talked about vegetation planted on any of those properties. That uh, the views are protected by the height and location of structures and through the selective pruning or removal of trees and vegetative matter at the end of the view corridors. So that was an insurance policy for the public that yes, the houses are one story, but any vegetation wasn't going to go higher than those roof lines. And that was supposed to be our insurance policy. And now um, trees have either grown naturally, or I know there were some trees that were kind of popped up like maybe four months ago, and they seem to be removed pretty quickly. Uh, so that was good. Um, it's Caltrans land, it's my understanding. So I hope that, I'm sure Caltrans has limited resources, and they certainly have other things that are maybe more important, dangerous trees falling or more road stuff. But I hope that they can address this uh, while the trees are relatively small, if there's any dead type trees there. And I'm sure that for the neighbors that live over there, if any of these trees were planted, the ones I saw that were, I'm sure it must be absolutely disheartening um, to think that trees are going to be taken down. Probably put some expense into planting them, whether they knew it was Caltrans land or not. Um, and again, full disclosure, I'm trying to have privacy and keep noise down where I live as well. So I'm sure that must be hard for them. But it's disheartening for me and all the people that signed on the um, website petition that there has to be a balance and you have to, we all live in this really beautiful area and people get to drive by it that we complain about the traffic. And so there's gotta be a balance and maybe keep it trimmed down to a certain height. I'm sure that would cost money and takes time. I do it myself every other month. But um, if that's the case, if they're planted, if they could please that, uh, there's other people involved in the public. Um, just check my notes, but I think that's it. So, thank you. I'd be very interested to have copies of the documents. Yeah, this is, I just pulled this one. I know I have others, but again, I just found out a few uh, minutes before. I can send it to you, I can email it to you. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Okay, next up we have Enoch Wong. Council members, uh, I'm a lawyer. I uh, represent one of the homeowners who lives on the other side, uh, one of the houses that is on the west side that uh, uh, who would suffer a, a serious negative impact if these trees were removed. Uh, there are six cypress trees, um, Monterey cypress trees uh, that are at issue, and one of them actually, uh, the trunk is on uh, the homeowner's property 
uh, it's James Gartrell and his wife. Uh, he's here in the room. Uh, they live at 214th Street. And uh, if it, according to the Civil Code uh, Section 833, if the trunk is on someone's property, then they're the owner. So one of those is, is their tree. The others is my understanding, and I was out there um, uh, just a few hours ago uh, there on the Caltrans right of way. And so I, I um, uh, agree with Lisa that uh, this is something that should be continued so there could be further discussion. And I appreciate all of Adrian's comments. And I, and I realize uh, she mentioned a few things that struck a chord. And uh, I'm a homeowner too. I mean, not, uh, not in this county, but I understand the um, importance of uh, being a good neighbor, uh, the uh, privacy, and also uh, having a shield from the noise. And all of those are uh, factors that um, would be negatively impacted um, for James and his wife were these trees to be cut down. Um, but moreover, the, probably the single uh, biggest thing uh, is the uh, significant negative uh, structural impact to stability to the hillside. These trees and, um, help to keep the soil from eroding further. And were these trees to be removed, uh, it, it would be a severe cost to them. They, they would have to do uh, potentially uh, significant engineering and structural work um, on their property. And so I, there's a bunch of uh, data that I'm gathering. Uh, James just found out about uh, this uh, petition and this draft letter on Monday. And I found out about it yesterday. So I literally have had uh, about 24 hours to, to look into this. And, and there's serious issues. And um, it, I think that, I, you know, I always am of the belief that I, I'd like to work with the, the interested parties, and uh, which includes uh, the council, uh, the neighbors, to uh, try to reach a solution. Um, and uh, I know that uh, James uh, would absolutely be willing to do the things that Adrian said that she's doing, which is to trim, to uh, maintain them so that they're in good shape, and uh, uh, to uh, protect them. And you know, there's various uh, things that have to be balanced. Um, and th this is all something that uh, I think two weeks uh, we can. Uh, James will be fully prepared. You know, well, well, we can revisit this, and um, I've also, in the 24 hours, been in uh, direct contact with the landscape architects at Caltrans with regards to the matter, and I'd like to make a presentation regarding uh, their viewpoints on this as well. So the, uh, and the, the last thing that, um, there's a number of ordinances, in particular, the, uh, there's a San Mateo County Heritage Tree Ordinance that requires a certain amount of notification and also um, there has to be a, an application anytime anyone wishes to cut down, uh, have a tree removed, whether it be on public or private property. So we, uh, I think all of us benefit from the time to look at the particular ordinances that are, um, that are impacted um, Caltrans and I'd also like to see the, the documents that Adrian referred to. And um, so I can, Lisa, if, if I, I think you're, I've seen your email, I know that I, I can email you as well and get uh, a copy of whatever she says. Yeah, she gets me the digital um, things I can send to you. Yeah, so that, that would be, I, I mean, the, the easy <coughs> thing uh, right now would be, I mean, it, and I do, although that's the only item on that draft letter that um, directly impacts James and his wife, I, I mean, I, I would, there are some, um, I guess, uh, I mean, we would be satisfied if that particular line item between the lighthouse and 14th Street was just taken off. But there's also, uh, you know, in particular with the ordinance, there are particular things, I mean, I would have suggestions with regards to that. I mean, I've looked at the ordinance and, um, I, mean, I mean, the important thing is that, you know, that this impacts the, the community and 
there's uh, various factors and interests that um, need to be considered and, and we need time to do that. So let me, let me just see if I uh, get what you're, what you're asking for, you know, it's that you, you were asking for this, um, this letter to be continued for, till the next meeting or the line item about the Montero Lighthouse to be taken off from this record and then that item be an agenda item for the next meeting? I, which, I think which of that, these is it, your you know I think request. this is a bigger issue i I think it's it's the um, we would be okay with either one of those um, and and I, I think that um, we would be okay if the that line item was taken off and consider it a future one or the whole letter itself to be considered at the next meeting okay and let me ask you another question are when you say there's more information that you want to present, is this information to um, support the property owner's case for leaving the trees, or is this information that's going to help and inform a compromise decision? What What is the position of the property owner in terms of the trees? Are they amenable to, to trimming, to a compromise, or is their position, trees stay in and you're gonna provide us with information ordinances and other data in support of that position? I think that there, it's possible to have a compromise uh, position. I, I know that um, James is, is willing to, as Adrian said, to, to trim, to keep it, uh, the trees healthy, and um, to, to keep them trim, it goes a, a long way. Um, and I think that, um, I really want to explore that uh, there could be a compromise, and and certainly and certainly uh, I, I want to show and have James uh, have the opportunity um, at some time before nine o'clock to show the uh, council pictures to so we can so you can actually see the various trees that are at issue and, and the uh, the factors that um, I've just touched upon. Dave, did you have a um, since you have acknowledged that a number of the trees are on the Caltrans right of way, are you prepared to enter into negotiations with Caltrans to take care of those trees? Absolutely. And do you think, uh, as I'm speaking to the lawyer specifically now, knowing how difficult Caltrans is to negotiate with, uh, do you believe that would be a successful negotiation? I absolutely do. Just in the past 24 hours alone, I've reached the key people and been able to make headway. And uh, so, absolutely. Okay. Does anybody else in the council have a question or comment for Enoch? Okay, all right, thank you, Enoch. Appreciate that. One second, Leonard. Next up, we have James Cartrell. My name is James Cartrell. I live at 214th Street, which is opposite of the highway of, of Adrian. I'm on the west side of Highway 1, um, just below the trees uh, that are being discussed here. Um, a couple things I want to reiterate is, is my wife and I are very adamant. Uh, we would absolutely love to adopt these trees, work with Caltrans to ensure that they are shapely and work to the public view in the best interest to preserve, um, to prefer, preserve Adrian's and other homeowners up 14th Street who are impacted by this view. As far as views from the roadway goes, it's probably very limited uh, impact in that as there are a number of other very large trees that surround these trees. Um, so it's, it's more a, an issue for, I think, the homeowners across the road than it is here. Um, I'd also like to, again, strongly emphasize that this hill is coming down. It is creeping down the hill. Just in the last year and a half alone, the hill has moved two feet towards um, into my property and continues to go so. And I fear that if we continue to top these trees, we're going to kill them um, as as one of them is already dying. And if we continue to, and if we remove these trees altogether, that hillside's gonna to continue to move into my property and cause a situation which is going to cost several hundred thousand dollars, if not more, to, to 
uh, abate that progression. Um, uh, the couple points I want to make. Um, there's some misperceptions about the tree that need to be cleared up, which is a, a, along the reasons why we want some time to kind of present and walk through this. Um, one of the trees is actually not in Caltrans right away. It's actually on my property. Um, three of the six trees in question are 50 plus years old. Um, and we're talking about trimming or chopping down really historic trees, which if we look at other parts of the local community pro or the LCP uh, program that, uh, that uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ketchum has uh, referenced in the letter, uh, these trees are specifically called out by that program for protection and conservation. Um, line, I think, 750, 7.50 in that ordinance, specifically calls out these trees to be protected. And I know that it's uh, this council's position in the past and the future to preserve um, the intent of that program and to preserve, in general, wildlife and, and, and nature. I'd also like to point out that it's a travesty that trees were actually pointed in the right way. And I fully endorse Caltrans removing the planted trees in the right way. The trees that remain are only naturally occurring trees and not trees that have planted, have, have been planted. And, uh, and I certainly, and my wife certainly didn't plant these trees or cause these trees to be planted in the Caltrans right away. Um, and I'm grateful that they were removed uh, uh, previously because I think destroying people's views and the pristine coast is, is definitely something we don't want to do. Um, uh, finally, I'd like to point out to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the council here that the petition that was put in place uh, to endorse the cutting down of these trees basically, um, doesn't basically, specifically states that these were quote unquote illegally planted trees in the right way. And I can certainly attest that the trees in question are, half of them are 50 plus years in age. The others have, I've seen them grow up from very small trees since I've lived there and are definitely naturally occurring. So um, I'm concerned that the petitions that are being signed and circulated actually have significant fallacies in them. And they also um, actually, I think the specific words of the petition are something along the lines of neighbors on the west side of of, high, of Highway 1 uh, on 14th Street are planting trees. I'm not planting trees, and I take issue with the fact that in public forums we're being basically slandered, um, and I don't like that. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's appropriate to be in, in, in any sort of petition that is circulated or signed amongst the community. And in fact, this, this has brought people to our property who have blocked our egress of the property, have abused and verbally assaulted my wife. Um, and I, 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 I implore the community, please don't put these divisive words into, our, uh, in, into, these, into these petitions. And, and yes, th this is about trees that are naturally occurring that are in the Caltrans five of which are in the Caltrans right away, one of which is in my or right away, or in my property that are being asked to be taken down. So um, again, um, if it's the council's position to kind of support the local com community program or the Mikos community program, uh, I urge you to strike this line item from this, this, uh, from this letter and or move this and possibly move this to further larger discussion within the groups and, or within the council. And I am definitely willing to take on the management and maintenance of these trees in such a way that they can grow to be beautiful additions to the stand of trees that already exist, that preserve the soil underneath, and provide great views for both people on the roadway and homeowners that are up 14th Street that uh, of the reason why we all live on the coast, isn't it? So, thank you very much. Thank you, James. 
Um, next, we've got John Cockman. Uh, excuse me, sorry, John. Sorry. Cockunda. Cockun. Cockunda. Cockunda. Yes, I. I was practicing it earlier today, <laughs> and I still got it wrong. I'm sorry, John. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is John Kakunda. I, um, I live in Montero, and I am on 14th Street, and I actually overlook the area where these trees happen to be. Uh, I am here speaking not only uh, on my behalf and my family, but also for um, James and Sylvia Marr and Giovanni uh, Iacarino, who could not be here tonight but asked me to speak. Uh, on behalf of their families, but also on, the, on behalf of the 33 families who have so far signed the petition asking for the removal of the young cypress trees. Much, some of what I'm going to say is rebuttal, um, but some of it is uh, redundant because uh, you, Lisa, thank you for um, explaining the situation pretty well. But um, in just Quick summary, um, this, the Monterey cypress trees that were planted west of Highway 1 on Caltrans property at the lighthouse uh, will, obviously they're going to grow to block public view. I understand James has specified that they were not planted. Um, they were all staked at one point, which leads one to believe that they are planted. I'm not suggesting James or or his wife planted it, but they were planted by somebody. Um, Caltrans did arrive. They removed some of the trees, and the stakes were pulled from the remaining ones. We're not talking about 50-year-old trees. We're talking about trees, and there are pictures um, uh, that are available. We're talking about trees that were um, planted within the last year uh, to 18 months and are now just starting to peak over the highway uh, by about three to four feet. At issue is public ocean views from the county designated scenic highway. The county's local coastal program, the LCP, has policies for development and landscaping to protect the views within the Cabrillo Highway scenic corridor. Not just for the neighbors, but for the public as people are driving past. They, uh, they have a right to view um, the ocean and the lighthouse as well. And you made a good point. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a really perfect place to see the lighthouse with the ocean behind it, including sometimes, when you're lucky, whales. Uh, again, as Adrian had said before, it's important to remember that when the houses were built about 10 years ago, the original designs were for two-story houses, um, but the public petitioned the county to preserve the public views by limiting the structures to only one story. Now those trees at the same area um, will, over time, grow five to six stories and thereby blocking the same views that were protected 10 years ago when the, when the houses were originally built. I want, I want to rebut a, a couple of things that were said earlier. Um, I didn't bring my attorney with me, so yeah. <laughs> Forgive me that you know this is this is this is a, a group of neighbors, concerned citizens speaking. This is um, you know against or about you know the the, the development of trees, um, and it seems to me that there is one family here, and there's one family that's really really concerned about the trees. They want them there. I can understand that. Um, they. I'm sure privacy is probably an issue. There are other ways to get privacy besides uh, growing massive cypress trees, which we know are, are responsible for blocking views all over the coast. Um, curtains could help. Uh, a trellis with some vine, uh, a uh, concrete barrier. There's a lot of things. Um, there was mention of soil erosion. There are pictures that have been already submitted uh, that prove that that is not the case at all. There is a retaining wall in place. The retaining wall has remained in place, has not moved, not two feet, not two inches. The entire hillside has uh, um, ice plants planted on it, holding the hillside in place. 
Those ice plants have been there for at least 15 to 20 years. The hillside has not moved anywhere. Um, it sounds like a bunch of red herrings. I, I apologize, this is the first time I ever meet James and it's unfortunate we meet under these circumstances. Um, these are not heritage trees as I said before. They're brand new or at least maybe 18 months at the most. Um, and uh, I did not write the, uh, the petition, uh, but I did read it and I did sign it. Um, this, uh, the comment about slander, I just did not see any n names of anybody in there. I think all it said was that they were planted, which I agree with, they were, they were, they were, te uh, um, they were staked in the ground. So uh, I, I'm, if anybody intends to slander James or his wife, uh, I'm very much against that. Uh, we don't operate that way in this community, um, but it is important to point out the truth, and the truth is that the trees were planted, uh, they need to be removed, and I fully support that the letter is sent to Caltrans as soon as possible. They are just growing like weeds on a daily basis, and soon those views will be gone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Leonard? I'm one of the strongest supporters of preserving trees. But I make an exception to that when the trees are there to block public views, whether accidentally or on purpose. And along Highway 1, most of the trees that are blocking the view are there to block the view on purpose. Um, it, it, and for some of my later comments, can you raise the screen? Because I'm going to go over there and point to the map. Um, regarding trimming trees, it doesn't matter who the property owner is. My understanding of the law is that if there's a tree branch of your neighbor's tree hanging over your property, you can cut, cut the branch at the property line. Um, there's probably some issues if you trim it in such a way that it causes the tree to die. I'm unclear on that part of the law, but I know you're allowed to cut it hanging over your property. Um, anything that's on Caltrans right away that was not there before the LCP was certified in 1980 should be summarily removed, period, end of discussion. It's illegal under the LCP. No discussion. And if these trees are as young as previous speakers said they are, they're not holding any soil. So that, that's a um, bogus argument. Any compromise has to maintain public views. And people saying, well, it's only interrupting a little bit of the view. You know, and then the next property owner says, it's only interrupting a little bit of the view. Ever heard the expression, death by a thousand cuts? That's what we have along the coast side, is every property owner wants to, to maintain their privacy at the public expense. And under the Coastal Act, um, Private views are not protected at all. There's zero protection for private views in the Coastal Act. The, the protections in the Coastal Act are for public views, and that means the view from Highway 1 is what's protected under the Coastal Act. So those are my general comments. Now, as far as El Granada goes, uh, maybe you can aim one of the microphones this direction. This wall of trees right here, cypress trees, was planted for the specific purpose of blocking the view for this whole part of El Granada and for people driving down the highway. So the next oversized, ridiculous, unnecessary, inappropriate building that violates the Coastal Act, he'll be able to say, well, it's not going to block any views because the trees block the view. These trees have to be taken out, and it, it, I'm unclear on where the right way is. The property line here looks like the trees are planted right up against the property line, but on the private property, which is proof that they're planted just to block the public view. So the Mid Coast Council has to do something to get this whole wall of trees taken out. This is the same businessman who allowed a wall of trees 
to be planted on the Caltrans right of way in front of the RV lot for the sole purpose of blocking the views and to protect the privacy of the permanent residents that are there illegally. He has permanent residents there which is illegal under the permitting for the project, under the Coastal Act. So a member of the community, not me, called Caltrans, complained about it. What did he do? He didn't cut them down. He pulled them out and moved them on the other side of the fence. Proof that they're there just to block the views. Now this is allowed because Half Moon Bay doesn't care. They hate the Midcoast because the Midcoast is a nicer place than Half Moon Bay and they're <laughs> jealous. They, they're envious of the Midcoast so they try and ruin it. With, 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 for those who don't know, the city limits of Half Moon Bay run up the edge here the, this this uh, dotted line here that's highlighted in yellow is the city limit. Now, this is illegal under current law, but the law was changed because of Half Moon Bay to prohibit this gerrymandering. So, so they have this thing that, that's referred to as the cherry stem, which somebody who was here at the time and I wasn't said, this is the thumb in your eye to El Granada. Um, so Half Moon Bay, this is the city limit of Half Moon Bay. The restaurant is the last thing that's in the city. And so the city has no dog in the fight. They don't care what goes on here. They let El Granada be ruined to benefit a handful of businesses there. And so what you have is, is a crooked city of Half Moon Bay supporting the crooked harbor district supporting a business ban that I can't use any adjectives because he'll sue me. And he is just hell-bent on ruining El Granada. Okay, let me, let me just jump in for a second. So, other than the <laughs> tutorializing letter, okay. what are you advocating with regard to this letter? That Caltrans has to uh, vigorously pursue anything that might... If these are one inch onto the Caltrans property, Caltrans needs to go sabotage them so they die. Okay? Caltrans needs to very carefully go out and measure and see where they are and get them off of their right away, no matter how small a part of it is on the Caltrans right away. Should the letter be sent? Um, this letter should be sent. I think another one needs to be a, a, a follow up on other parts of the mid coast. Okay, so, but your position is you support this particular letter? Uh, I, understanding as as that you. Not, as long as it's not the last letter on the topic. I seriously doubt it will be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we need to start somewhere. Just consider this, that that's the start, but we need to pay attention to the rest of the unincorporated bid coast. And this is also going to mean writing some strong letters to the Harbor District, uh, which is summarily dismissed. L Lisa and I forget who else met with some people from the Harbor District. They agreed to do something. They did absolutely nothing. They agreed to do it, but they didn't do it, and I could have told you in advance that that was going to happen, that they would say, yeah, we'll take care of it, and that they wouldn't actually take care of it because they hate us. And uh, the, the Harbor District really should have been dissolved years ago. Okay, hold on. Let's, so, let's um, stick with this. It's but, getting but, topic. But, it's but, getting late. But you're, it, I, I, I want the council to commit to writing a strong letter, the same letter to go to the Harbor District and the city about the, the travesty at the RV lot. Duly noted. Okay. Um, James, I have your speaker slip for redirect, but I'm really reluctant to get into a tit for tat back and forth. I think, I think we know, I don't want to get in, he said, and then he said, and I want to rebut this, and I want to rebut this. So unless, James, you have new information that you can briefly bring here, um, because the council needs to deliberate on what we're going to do with this letter. Yes, absolutely. Just, uh, I'll be brief. Thank you. At best. Um, the two things, or three things I wanted to very quickly address. One is the hillside is marching forward, and I can show you pictures of the hillside marching forward. James, we understand that, but that hillside that's moving is not the part of the Caltrans right away. Yes. Is that correct? This is from the Caltrans right away into my property. Okay, because the, the picture doesn't actually show that, so it's hard to tell. Thank you. Show where, 
It, it's all right. I, I, I'm taking your word for it. Just, right just away. take my word for it. I just, I just want to say I, it I is, wanted to clarify. It's here. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of responding to John's statement earlier. Since I actually live there, I can see it, and I know. Anyway, this is just in the last uh, year and a half that it's moved. The the other uh, issues I want to address is these are not year and a half old trees. These are much older trees. Um, in fact, they've been uh, consistently vandalized year to year to year. I've got police reports going back several years of people trimming, chopping illegally these trees in the Caltrans right away. That's not Caltrans. So um, these are not baby cypress trees. They're substantial trees. They've been here a while. And half the ones that you're proposing taking out are, have been here for 25 to 50 years. Um, it may be even longer, maybe even close to 100 years for, for one of them. Um, and um, my belief is they were specifically put there originally to abate the washing out of that entire area from, because it tends to do so every 100 years or so. Um, let me see if there's anything else on my list. Uh, uh, yes, um, the other thing is, is that, yes, this is for great scenic views, these are for great scenic views, but from the roadway, these don't really change the impact of visually from the roadway. And if somebody's looking over their right shoulder as they're passing these trees going southbound on Highway 1, they're not paying attention to the pedestrians who are trying to cross the street from the lighthouse at 16th Street. And that would just represent a, 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 a traffic danger as it stands. So um, that's a brief comment. Thank you, James. OK, Carl. In this discussion, I think a lot of us are sort of lost as to exactly what trees we're talking about. <laughs> uh, if we haven't gone out there with these specific issues, uh, some people are saying a hundred year old trees, some people are saying a year and a half old tree, which is like that big around. <laughs> you know? uh, and we may be talking about different trees. It's, it almost sounds to me like this. The Coastal Act has sections, and believe me, it's been years since I memorized all this crap, but about the viewshed from Highway 1 to the ocean. And this, the matter of trees and buildings and so forth, built between Highway 1 and the ocean, get into sections of the coastal land. That viewshed that is supposed to be protected. The LCP is simply a local reflection of the coastal act. Everything in the LCP is supposed to conform to the Coastal Act. Uh, I think the whole thing here is if this is a viewshed issue, and we have a major controversy going on here, I think a field trip or whatever among the different folks might be wise to go out and see, is this viewshed from a car going by actually impacted? You know, and now I know a lot of, through a lot of Montero, it is, but uh, in this place where, you know, I still remember the story poles for the higher houses that then got reduced to one story and so forth. And I think the view shed is over the tops of those houses is okay. But, <laughs> you know, now we're talking about something else that might be in that view shed. And all of this is sent long since the Coastal Act was first passed with these sections having to do with the view from Highway 1 to the ocean. And so I think we need to know is very specifically is are these is this place that we're talking about directly uh, addressed by the Coastal Act? And so, whatever's done in there since then that might have violated the Coastal Act in the sections of the local coastal plan uh, is in violation of it. And <laughs> you know that's pretty clear. But since we don't ex really exactly know what we're talking about here from person to person, I think it would be maybe a good idea to delay the letter uh, a few weeks until we can all be very clear on what we're discussing. There may be very well be an easy compromise. It may, it may be that these trees can easily be trimmed so that the viewshed concern is eliminated and not all the trees are removed. I mean, I don't know that without going to the specific place. Okay, thank you, Carl. So John, I just want to say, John, same thing I said to James, which is if you have new information, but I don't want to tit for tat back and forth of like every point that James has made no, countered. Two things. One is these are trees 
on the west side of the highway. We're, so I just want to make that clear. These are not trees that somebody's trimming on the east side of the highway, so it does affect all the traffic. Second is the trees are already blocking the scenic corridor from the highway. It's not as though you know, they're, they're going to grow. They're, they will grow to completely block it, but they are already blocking it. So they would have to be trimmed further down than they are right now. But if there is concern about it and, and there is some confusion about newer trees versus 50-year-old trees, maybe it would be in our best interest then to modify the letter a little bit to say we are not talking about trees that are 50 years old or older. And by doing that, we're now guaranteeing that we're talking about more recently developed trees. If, we, if, if that is the big concern, if that's going to be the one thing holding back, maybe we can just put that little sentence in there so that Caltrans knows, okay, we're not going to be taking out any deeply rooted, established 50-year-old trees. We're just looking at, at the newly planted ones. Okay. Just a... Yep. Thanks. I'm sorry. Bill? <laughs> Leonard, I think you've had your quota. I mean, the, the editorializing on the last one used up your quota. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. You, you're way over. <laughs> I, I, I want to get out of here, too. Um, two things. One is, I know um, James and his lawyer, and I forgot your name. John. 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 Um, looking for a compromise, what have you. I'm talking to the council now. Um, uh, James said, you know, to try and keep the trees trimmed. Uh, they got yeah. Um, what happens if when he sells and moves, he, they're still going to keep going? And number two, this is mainly for James' benefit. Get an arborist because cypress trees are very shallow root. A nice big rainstorm, they're not going to hold the soil, they're going to blow over and land on your house. Most people out here move the cypresses away from their house. It's well known fact on the coastline, you, they act like a wind sail. So they're not going to keep the soil there. Maybe if you have to replace them, replace them with the lower growing trees that are denser, that will block the noise. I can give you the name of a few good arborists, they're expensive, but there's plenty of them here. But those are just the two things I wanted to mention. Okay, thanks. Leonard. Ten seconds, Leonard. Any trees that were planted after 1976 Coastal Act on the west side of the highway are illegal. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to close public comment. So, Council. Dave? Several things. Um, <laughs> I've walked and ridden that many, many times. There are no 50-year-old trees in the highway right away. Um, second, the champion uh, cypress tree is a very specific tree down in Pescadero. It is not all cypress trees. Thankfully, the LCP was not quite that silly. Um, I am third, we're talking about Caltrans. Caltrans uh, just paid for an extremely expensive repair at 8th Street. They are in the middle of doing another extremely expensive repair at 10th Street, both due to erosion. They are not going to be cutting down or pulling out trees. They're going to cause more erosion that is going to cause another problem. Um, it's the same people involved in all of that. I believe that wording the language in the letter is good. It should stand. And I fully support removing cypress trees in the right way. OK. Um, Claire, did you have a comment? Uh, I would probably support uh, tabling this for a little more working on it. What I'm hearing f feels a little bit of a mishmash of, of how we're looking at the situation. The, this letter is specifically oriented toward Caltrans, but it sounds like there's also a problem with, with private residents, and there's also a problem with uh, perhaps with what Leonard's saying about El Granada. And it might make sense to have something that's a little more encompassing as a position. Encompassing in what, in what way? Um, rather than simply focusing on Caltrans, to, to focus more on uh, the, our basic advocacy for uh, open views. So the LCP um, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, the LCP um, statute, okay. Um, Lisa, did you have anything that you want to add to this? Yeah, so um, like I said, I, going in, I, I have some corrections I would like and uh, it's very helpful to hear all the comments and to get new information about the, the agents who send and uh, redraft the letter for our next meeting. Uh, 
I would not be inclined to expand this beyond Caltrans. I think that we're going to write, I think this, this creates a very concise request and it's less controversial. And plus, you know, you, if we're talking about trees on private property, that's a whole different thing. You're going to the county, you're going to the property owners, all oh, it's more controversial, it's whatever. And uh, so just talking about the Caltrans right of way makes this simpler and also the letter does already say specifically, we're talking here about removing shrubs and young trees. Uh, we didn't ask for any forest trees to be removed. So uh, given all the comment, it, uh, I would like to revise the letter and bring it back. Uh, if the way I describe it sounds out of line with what you're thinking, I mean, would you be okay with just keeping the focus here on the Caltrans right away? As long as we didn't lose sight of bigger issues as well. Yeah, I just think it would. Yeah. Well, bigger issues would be a whole other subject. I mean, we have been We're not very active in, in coastal views. And in the past, the Mid Coast Community Council was involved in a tree ordinance, which never unfortunately made it. But those are two separate issues from this letter in my mind. I also okay. think that you get into much more controversy when you talk about removing large trees. Basically, okay, we do have a tree or ordinance. If you have a significant tree it's above a certain diameter, then you do need a permit. But I'm not even talking about trees that are that big. Talking about trees that are smaller than that. You don't even need a permit to remove it. And uh, because there are a lot of people who appreciate the large trees. And if it's there, whatever. I, I'd just rather just, you know, what, as John said, you know, you, you look, the view from your car or from the other side of the highway, if you're walking the coastal trail or the parallel trail, which will be there, the view you have now is very special. The ocean, lighthouse, and, and these trees, how, however old they are, are just starting to come up into that view. And uh, or at least half of them are just starting to come up into that view. And to uh, uh, cut them, it's like to take a 40 foot plus tree that can be a beautiful thing and make it into a shrub just pains me. But anyway, um, that's what I would prefer to do to come back with the revised letter. So when we talk about coming back with a revised letter, <coughs> um, it would be essentially the same, those same three bulleted point specific locations, but more specific language about what we're asking for, or how, how would this letter be? Uh, first of all, I would, the second paragraph with the references to the LCP, yes. I would revise that. Um, I'll look up the, instead of just going to the LCP, I'll go look in the Coastal Act 2, see what I come up with, uh, and any other kind of references to support this, uh, like uh, a lot of people acknowledged here, this is only about the public views from the highway. Well, and, uh, if oh, and I also want to add in about the right. previous, that's important. Um, and then as far as the specific locations, um, I don't know, I mean, I kind of like the way it just called out the location and just said, a row of, you know, young cypress there that are going to grow up as they are already starting and, you know, and, and just like Caltrans and the, and the homeowner or whatever uh, discuss this and decide, well, maybe a couple of them on the southern end need to remain and the other ones, I don't, I mean, the, the, I don't think we need to get micromanaging, well, no, this tree did that tree did that tree, you know, it's just in general, let's keep this view open. And uh, I think it's, it's useful that the larger of the trees are the ones further out of the view. You know, the ones that are right, going to block right in the middle, they're the smaller trees. Give most benefit from taking them out, and the ones that have already been removed. So, um, I kind of like to, whatever, we'll see how it develops, and then we can come back and do this again. So, it sounds like we have a couple of options. We can approve this letter as is. We can amend the letter, and I mean, excuse me, vote on this letter as is. Uh, we can uh, vote on an amended version of this letter. We can vote to continue this discuss this letter as an agenda item for the next meeting. I move we continue the item to our next meeting. 
Okay, we have a motion on the table to continue this item until the next meeting. Do I have a second for that motion? I'll second. Okay, so the motion is to continue this letter uh, to the next meeting for further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Five zero. This uh, agenda item is continued to the next meeting, which will be May 25th. And, and I would suggest to James <coughs> and anybody else uh, who's concerned about that that you certainly start the negotiations with Caltrans. Um, they're generally pretty good about talking to the neighbors. Um, so. Okay. Thank you, public, and thank you, council. That was a was a thorny one. Um, council activity. Does anybody have any council activity they want to report on? Dave. <clears throat> I attended the Happening Bay City Council meeting last Tuesday. Um, I was following up on the um, armoring of the bluff proposal they had. They did amend the contract on that, uh, as I had hoped. Uh, so we'll see what comes out of that. Um, this was the section between uh, Seymour and uh, Seymour and Redondo Beach, if I remember correctly. Anyway, south of Seymour. Um, they also are taking up the no smoking in public ordinance again. Uh, city attorney was asking for guidance on what areas to cover. Um, they gave pretty general guidance that they wanted to cover just about everything. There was some talk back and forth about excluding streets so people could smoke in their cars. They're also excluding multifamily residences. That was one of the big controversial issues. So the, both single family and multifamily homes will continue to be able to smoke inside. Um, and uh, as probably almost everybody knows, they did approve the the redesigned fire uh, um, prop, the, the training tower. Great, thank you, Dave. To what uh, height? It's a total, feet, total 45 feet, but the top five feet is now an open railing instead of a closed parapet. So it's uh, five, five feet shorter than it was, and the top five feet is now open. Okay, anything else, Dave? That's it. Any other council members have? Oh, Lisa. Well, I don't know. I was kind of waiting for Dave to say something about that he attended the Board of Supervisors on the cost of Ah, yes. I had sent out mail to the uh, to the council, but obviously the public didn't hear it. Um, the use permit uh, appeal for the Costa Nera was neither approved nor denied. Uh, instead, the uh, Board of Supervisors decided to continue it for six months with the promise to uphold the appeal if the existing violations were dealt with, uh, which did not include demolishing the patio, but they're not allowed to use the patios, either one, um, and they must have no new violations for the next six months. And the, it was not stated what would happen if they do have new violations in the actual motion, but it was very clear in the discussion that in that case, they would deny the appeal. Okay. So I just wanted to add on that topic that um, right at just the day before the Board of Supervisors hearing, there was the Coastal Commission uh, sent a letter issuing a notice of intent to commence cease and desist order and administrative civil penalty proceedings against the property owner, Amity Group, for the long-standing and repeated violations of the coastal access provisions of the Coastal Act uh, due to unpermitted development and non-compliance with the terms of the coastal development permit. And the daily fine is how much? I don't know, but this is actually rather unusual. This is um, comes from the code compliance at the state level. So it's been bumped up to that level, and um, so we'll see what happens. And uh, we've had several agenda items on this. If you're interested in this topic, please go to the MCC website. There's lots and lots of uh, information about this topic. Anybody else? Okay, great. Um,
future agendas at our next meeting we're going to revisit this letter to Caltrans and we're also going to have presentation of identified issues and proposed resolutions for county subdivision ordinance update. Joe Claire from County will be here. And I would like to uh, put a letter probably on consent mm -hmm. um, about tsunami evacuation uh, okay. to request an update and clarity of the route and the signs. <laughs> <laughs> they direct you, uh, we, I live in a tsunami evacuation area and the signs direct us to go north and then go to the highway, and then go south directly to Surfer's Beach. <laughs> Whereas there is a shelter in Moss Beach. So, um, yeah, because by the time you've gone that whole thing, the wave has crashed and gone yeah. back out. And so, yeah, so, so at least over Granada, our signs got changed to not point onto Surfer's Beach anymore. <laughs> OK, well, I look forward to that letter, Lisa. <laughs> um, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.